April 10th. Madam Chairman? Yes. I have an, uh, a correction. Um, item 5D, report on meeting with legislators. It lists Peter Leslie as part of that uh, team that went to Augusta. Peter Leslie was not part of that team. All right. I would like that stricken. Jeez, I accept that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other additions or corrections to the minutes? Do I hear a motion that the minutes be approved as corrected? So move. Second. And second. And all in favor? All right. We'll move on to the business manager's report. Thank you. Uh, to date, as far as the revenues, uh, we're pretty well on schedule. We have received to date 84% of our revenues, or $6.8 million out of the possible 8.1. You notice we've added the line called the property tax relief where the town of Cape Elizabeth did receive $77,645 to be used for education for 89-90 school year. Therefore, lowering the line above it, which is the local commitment without, uh, without uh, state uh, participation. The following page outlines the uh, expenditure report to date for the month of uh, April. To date, the uh, elementary school has expended 77% of its budget, or $1.3 million. The middle school has, uh, has expended 83% of their budget, or $2.046 million, while the high school has spent $2,092,000, or 76% of their budget. The undistributed or district-wide expenses have spent 73% of their budget, or $828,000, for a total district-wide of $6.3 million out of the possible 8,119,000 or 78% of the budget. Projected, uh, we ran the preliminary figures on Friday as far as the projected $350,000 balance come June 30th, 1990. And to date, that figure seems to be realistic. However, what's gonna happen with the purchase of the bus is that our our balance will be down by the $46,103. $46, However, the state revenue for next year will be increased by that amount of money. So it's, it's a wash. Any questions? Any questions on the revenues or expense for the general program? The following page outlines the anticipated revenues and expenditures to date for the uh, federal and state programs. To date, we have received $143,000 in revenues and have expended $92,000 or a balance of $50,000. Next two pages outline the food service program. April had revenues of $22,540 with expenditures of $25,272 or a loss of $2,731. To date, the food service program is in the red by $34,278. Hopefully, with uh, the month of May, this month and next month with our food buying, our food costs hopefully going down due to using of uh, what's left over to finish the year, we will come in at the realized $25,000 loss as projected somewhere in uh, January or February. We have, uh, as the public is probably aware of, budgeted $25,000 in the general program next year to fund school lunch. Can we go back to uh, federal and state programs, revenues, and expenditure sheet? Sure. Uh, I noticed under local entitlement 8990, you have received 33200 but nothing's been expended. Okay. The reason for that, uh, Charlie, is that the line above that, if you notice to that 8889, we ended last June with $30,708, and that's what we are using up first. And there is still 1073 that money to be used before we do spend or start to spend the 33 too. Whatever's not spent there can be carried over into next year's uh, unexpended balance for federal and state programs. So what is the reason why it's not being spent? 
Why? Because what happened, if the, th this money is used, uh, maybe Wayne can help me out here. It's being spent, uh, let me say that first. Uh, Why don't you go to the microphone, please? Local entitlement um, is expended primarily in uh, two areas. One, a staff a, a position at Pond Cove and has been for a number of years. And secondly, in contracted services, a number of the bills for contracted services become heavy in April, May, and June. And so you uh, would see a sizable reduction in that normally in July. Uh, there's, there's almost always a certain level of carryover in local entitlement um, because it's hard to anticipate the use of that for contracted services. For example, your school psychologist uh, for evaluations, uh, neuropsychological evaluations unanticipated during the year, occupational therapy, physical therapy, additional therapies for uh, children that move in. Uh, it, it's a uh, it's a fund source that we use for a number of, you could call unanticipated, albeit they always show up every year, uh, needs. So is that system-wide, or is this yes, more it heavy? Is, Shelley. You said part of that is a staff position in the elementary. And there's one staff position which has been carried by local entitlement, I believe, here since it was initiated in 1978 um, for multiply handicapped children. So you, would you say that it's more heavily spent in the lower grades where you're addressing for higher grades, or just to eat kind of even? It's more spent perhaps at the K six, in the K-6 range than in the 7-12, primarily because you have more children referred in those years for services. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? The next report, your in your agenda is the Community Services Financial Report. To date, uh, as of April 30th, they have collected or received $384,000 and have spent $296,000. Year to date, we anticipate uh, $35,000 as a carryover balance into FY91. And that's been figured into the next year's budget? That's correct. And with that balance, the, the Community Services budget or appropriations to the town next year will be a no increase or 16 cents to the taxpayers. The same as it was this year and last year. It's been 16 cents for the last two years. This will be the third year. And the final report is the enrollments uh, for the month of, uh, as of May 1st, with the high school at 424, no change from last month. The middle school is at 335 with no change from the previous month, and the elementary school is at 809 with a decrease of five students from last month. District-wide, we have 568 students in Cape Elizabeth. I have a question on enrollments. How many out-of-district students have come into this district this year? I know there was essentially a freeze put on by the board. How many have come into the system? And where? I don't have my list uh, with me, but I did that uh, two months ago. The, uh, we've added children of employees this year, and uh, that's the largest number. Uh, I would say uh, we haven't added any on the K-8 level because the policy is such that we don't. And we added approximately I want to say two or three at the high school level that were interviewed by the high school principal. And those were tuition paying students? They're uh, waiver students. In other words, the tuition comes to us. The state tuition came to us. So there, there have been no additions in anywhere else in the system this year? No. Okay. I can't. I, I'll be more than happy to pull my whole list out and put it in the backup for next time. I would be interested. So you can see every one of them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this time our high school representatives here this evening. Yeah, there's Peter and Jennifer.
Um, well, first of all, let me just run down a few of the highlights that are going on at our school this month. Um, our production of Anything Goes the musical will be done opening nights in two weeks, and rehearsals are going on tonight and every night this week. And with student actors and orchestra and chorus and direction, um, it's really going to be quite impressive, and we're looking forward to it. Um, the other two nights it's going to be playing is June 1st and the 3rd. It's a Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. So it'll be quite a weekend for our drama department. Um, May 24th, which is a week from tomorrow, is the date of our prom. And juniors and seniors are looking forward to that. It's going to be at the Portland Club this year. And um, th it'll be a lot of fun as well. Also, our school is going to be hosting some Quebec exchange students this weekend, or students from our school in our French club. Uh, it's a combined trip. We, we went up there um, combined with some students from South Portland. It was sponsored by the Rotary. And um, they're going to be coming down here now this weekend, and we'll be doing things like taking a cruise around Casco Bay and having dinners and barbecues and getting to know their culture like, you know, like they're going to get to know ours, I suppose. Um, so it's an interesting exchange. It helps us with our French and our, and our um, knowledge of the cultures as well. Um, right now, I guess, um, Jen's going to give you some other things. And then she just basically wants to give a message that I, I think the gist of it is that you know, you've been getting so much input about the budget and, and all of the problems that that there's been having, but um, I guess like, we wanted to communicate that we are the students and the ones that are being affected, and, and while it, it's not going to do a lot this year, because obviously there's a lot of problems that need to be worked out quickly, um, we think that in the future, if the student council could get involved, then we could be better represented, and it might help us in the future to avoid some of the problems of this year. Thank you, Peter. Uh, as most of you know, April 21st through the 28th was Earth Week and Capels with high school students had the opportunity to celebrate that in many ways. There was an all-school assembly and there were speakers there who ranged from the president of the Audubon Society to a person on the CMP staff and students were given the opportunity to ask questions as to their roles in ecology. There was also a field trip to SD Warren and several students from chemistry classes got to participate in that. There was a school-wide Cape cleanup which was on Wednesday of that week and Students from the high school had the opportunity to get out of class and go and roam the streets, I guess, and pick up trash. And they came up with about 90 bags of trash, which was great. Um, there was a play put on by several students, which also included some help from the first graders who participated. And at the end of the week, there was a tree planting. And that included every class got their own tree, and the faculty got their own tree. So it was really great to end the week out with that. Our baseball team is undefeated. That's pretty excited. Um, the baseball and softball teams had games in Wells today. And the track and the cross teams are also both successful. Just have one more topic. In regard to the budget cuts and so on, I'd just like to bring to your attention that many high school students don't feel that they've been <clears throat> appropriately involved in your decisions. Um, no, one is much, no one knows as much about the effects of certain cuts than do the students of these schools. No one has asked us how we feel, and we just think that our input into the decision process should be considered. We realize that you will make your decisions, but in the future we'd like the opportunity to adequately represent ourselves so that you know, so that you know what you're actually jeopardizing when you cut. I'd like for you all to take back to your student body the fact that all of our workshops are open, mm -hmm. and you're cordially invited to those workshops. Okay. And and if you can give us a Saturday, we've got one that usually runs from about nine to nine on Saturday. That mm -hmm. sort of is the culminating, and we invite you next year, and we'll try to to see that that uh, you get a special invitation because that nothing would please us more than to have as many high schoolers as possible there to hear the budget process and react to the decisions that are made by your school board. Or other students, for that matter. All students, right. There was a middle school student who spoke quite eloquently yes. the other night. Thank, Thank you. you both. Madam Chairman, yes. along the same lines, I, I've been approached by a middle school student that would be interested in um, making a presentation at our board meetings like the high school students do to tell us what's happening in their school. Um, I, I don't know, you know how that gets added, but... Well, I think it gets added by us inviting them to be a part of our agenda. And I, I think we might approach that through, through Mr. Toy and see if, if, there, if the interest is there and if there's someone that would be willing to represent perhaps through your student council beginning in the fall. Mm -hmm. We'd like that. Ms. Morrison, if you'd like to come to the, the microphone now, we'll put you on the agenda. I'm sorry, I
only issues? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you have several? <laughs> I do. I do. Um, as a follow-up to the two high school students, I have um, received from my sophomore list of, of 20 canceled courses, which I just received this week. There are a lot of them, and, and a lot of them are IA, and I don't really understand too much what's going on there. So I, I'm not minimizing my concerns for IA. It's just I, I don't really understand how that works. But what I, I'm really focusing on this evening um, is Spanish 5. Uh, another one is reading, and another is graphic design. There are others. There's contemporary music, music clubs, um, Western, uh, Western Civ, Verbal Aptitude. And, and I come with strong feelings thinking that these are strictly high school standard fare. I mean, I don't think any of these are excessive or fluffy. So I, I, I really am concerned. I'm focusing on Spanish because I know that Spanish is alive and well in the elementary, and I'm wondering why one Spanish five is eliminated in high school. Um, I, I know numbers are always a concern, but I think we need to keep in mind that with a little over 400 students, when you advance in through the years, uh, particularly junior and senior year, the interests fan out, so the numbers thin. So I'm not so sure how justified that is. I also know with Spanish 5, still at this point, in order to be um, headed in that direction, as an eighth grader, you had to give up either uh, home ec or IA, and you took Spanish 5 as an elective. So these are our kids who are now entering senior year, and they don't get Spanish 5. Um, if there's no one to take Spanish 5, that's fine. I'm very concerned because I have a sophomore who's headed to junior year and Spanish 4 next year, and there are quite a few kids in that class, so I'm wondering what happens after next year. Is there no longer a Spanish 5? And I think to sidetrack these kids, as opposed to the elementary kids, is, is pretty unfortunate. Um, the other thing that I'm focusing on is graphic designs. Once, once again, I don't know why this is canceled, but I do know I went to an Arts Every Day conference a couple of weeks ago, and Susie Terrian put on a workshop whose middle school, yeah, middle school, and then uh, Laura Giverts and Celeste Roberge were a part of that workshop. It was outstanding. And Laura got up representing her graphic design course, and she showed the books that her students had made. And these were visual narratives. They were so overwhelmingly impressive, both in number and quality. And the uh, group that I was involved with in terms of uh, art teachers from all over, the impression that this high school made, I couldn't bring, possibly bring back to you. So I'm looking at this, and this is gone. Uh, advanced art. If, if you frequent the library, you'll know in March the, these two art teachers put on a wonderful art show in that gallery. There were statements that accompanied their artwork, so there's a combination of visual form and written form. I mean, that's what education is about. So I, I look and that's gone. Um, the reading lab, I hear, is eliminated. I can't imagine that that is, is not a value. Uh, I came to a workshop a couple of weeks ago, or the school board budget meeting, and I noted that language arts in the elementary was so critical from K through uh, 2. So I look at reading lab, and I, I, I don't understand why this isn't critical. And once again, I'm wondering about numbers, but there aren't great numbers in the high school. So you can't use numbers to back justification for all of these courses. Um, so that's. That I bring with, with uh, grave distress. There are many other things, and, and as I say, I don't, I don't understand a lot of them. Um, the uh, other thing that I wanted to focus on, and we are, can I say something about language arts now? I know it's on. Why don't we address your first statement? It, oh, okay. Frank, would you like to say a, just a word so that, that we won't be skipping around? Do we have these working now? Are the microphones working? Okay, this, if there is any way to get them I working for the this working? those who are watching. Yeah, I, I think this one's work. working, but I'm... See, here, yours is. So is yours, Peter. They're all working. I, I think you just have to, to yeah. speak into the... Well, I think you have to speak into the mic. Um, l let me start with, with the, the general concern about 
uh, cutting back various programs in the high school and, and no one is more concerned than I am uh, we would like to offer as rich a program as we can um, but we we have to s somehow have a guideline as to when we can can offer a course and when we cannot um, we are a high school that in the last three years has shrunk from 560 students to 400 students or 410 students next year um, it w we we have had to as a matter of necessity cut staff in in a, almost every department and that has been painful and we no one has in, in, has found that a, a task to, to their liking uh, along with that cut in staff goes the richness of the program that we can offer as a smaller and smaller high school and i think as the, the high school expands in the future we can expand the program uh, some of these cuts are are um, are I think very explainable and, and are, are not permanent cuts. Let me start with the Spanish cut. Um, the, the Spanish uh, courses, um, and we want to offer five levels of Spanish and that is our goal over the long run. Um, the, the upper level Spanish courses have shrunk so much in enrollment that what we are having to do is combine a Spanish four and a Spanish five course and I, I, I know the the document to which you're referring which students got in their packet and I, I, th I think that is an error I think that that Spanish five students should be there as well but there are very few Spanish five students I don't remember the precise number but I, I think it was um, well under 10 and it in terms of budgeting for a teacher I think the figure we use for an average teacher is, is roughly what thirty two thousand dollars that we figure it costs us so each course in the high school is is uh, something like sixty four or five hundred dollars that it costs and we simply have to begin to make some judgments as to when we're going to drop enrollment or combine classes and I think what we are going to have to do in the short run in a few cases uh, is offer a combined course a uh, Spanish four or five which will be a literature focused course um, which we we think will still be small enough and, in, and will be very uh, a very small class in any case um, will allow the teacher to individualize it but it is certainly our intent that as soon as we have the enrollment and we expect the enrollment as the as the language program expands in the lower grades and the middle grades that we will offer five levels of of, of both French and Spanish and we are concerned about that and and it's I, we hope a very temporary decline and not certainly one we want permanent in industrial arts um, we we have had um, enrollments in industrial arts the, the last two years that have been um, um, lower than we would like and we we did not cut the program last year but felt we had to this year and unfortunately um, when you cut a, a, a three-person department um, you you cut one-third of your program resources in terms of what people can offer and um, a, a number of courses were cut particularly in in the area of auto mechanics and welding and, and sort of the machine shop because the skills of the teachers um, who are remaining with the program are not the same as the teacher who is um, being um, uh, reduced in force if you will uh, the word riff is, is I think not not the right word it's just it's a hard word but um, so that that's why there are a number of, of industrial arts courses that are listed what the industrial arts um, faculty has done is to try to combine courses where possible uh, that is to combine appropriate um, offerings so that even though there are still well under 10 in many of the courses by combining students in clusters of two and three courses um, that are complementary and that can be staffed at the same time there's a reasonable number of students to be covered by a teacher and we can still maintain the richness of the program again we don't like that um, uh, but we are we really have to make some some sacrifices there in art, um, no one is is more distressed than I that the graphic design course is not being offered. But really, I think only one or two students signed up for it next year, and there's a reason for that. The, the art faculty has changed the art program for next year, changed the basic art course from a two semester course to a one semester course, and is introducing some new curricula. Um, one of which is a course in ceramics. Um, and Laura Giffords cannot teach everything all at once so what we are doing in some of the art electives is going to try to offer courses on an every other year basis so that students will have um, over the course of their high school career 
some options to take uh, courses like graphic design, which has been a, a wonderful course this year and it had uh, a very strong enrollment and as an introductory course or, or as a, on, a, on a sort of a new basis, we allowed students to, to take that course who had had no experience in art and the strong feeling of the faculty is that they ought to have had taken the, the foundation art course. So that precludes really offering that course next year, but it is not a course we intend to cut from the course of study. It's simply a course that is not offered next year, and I think many colleges and universities do that. They simply alternate courses on, a, on an every other year basis and try to keep the richness of the curriculum without having to offer it every year. And it allows us, with a small faculty, to try to keep a, a relatively um, rich curricula. In reading and vocabulary, we have changed that, and we, we did um, have to re reduce the reading program in, in terms of staffing, um, and, and have now really incorporated and, and sort of unified um, the language arts program at the high school. The high school has traditionally sort of called things by, by different content, but um, what we are doing is we are offering two sections of a course called English uh, uh, Skills, um, which is really to support both the reading and the vocabulary study and, and the, some of the, the writing needs of some students who need extra support. So I think that there are only, I, I think, 10 students signed up for reading courses next year for reading particularly, and I think another six or seven signed up for vocabulary. Um, and, and yet we are really offering two sections that can accommodate um, somewhere on the order of, of 30 people between them in, in that course. And so there's, there is room there, and I think that we have every intention of offering support to students who need that. Um, in the high school curriculum, um, in almost all cases, the students who are in the reading courses need reading support rather than what I might call, well, I, I may get in trouble here because I'm not a reading expert, but it's, it's not so much that students cannot read as they cannot read well. And I think that, that the students who really have serious difficulty in reading are frequently in special education and get more direct and, and specifically skilled instruction. What, what the students who we find uh, are in the reading classes are there really, uh, many of them are students who have been in special education. They have left special education with the, the, their parents and their uh, request to do so and the special education department's uh, blessing. Uh, they need support. Um, and I think we feel that we can do an excellent job doing that, you know, with the English skills course. So again, we are as, as unhappy as you are, and, and, uh, and I think as unhappy as many of the students are about that. And I think that uh, the concern of the, s the high school representatives, uh, the student representatives, is, is well taken. I think next year in, in the high school, um, we plan to use a, a different process in terms of both budget building and budget review, and I have spent some time with both Jen and Peter over the April vacation trying to explain the budget and the budget process. And uh, we would like to involve the student council not just in the budget hearings before the board, but really in the whole budget process. Just, I'm not sure they'll be involved in terms of submitting budget requests, but I think that they will be much better informed than they were this year because we find that the SAC this year has become, I think, a very important institution in the school and a very responsible one and it's very difficult for them to, to be responsible young adults if they are not well informed, and, and uh, certainly they need to be better informed, and we have every intention of doing that. D does that answer your questions, Mrs. Morrison? Yeah, I, I think, um, come, on, come on, come on back. And <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna need to limit. <laughs> well, what uh, I hear yeah, about. I, I, I need to say that this is a, a somewhat of a rehash of, of what we have talked about before, so we need to try to limit it to just well, a few more Spanish minutes. Well, Spanish isn't. All right, speak on the Spanish. Okay, the um, th with, with the Spanish, I, I think you have to bear in mind that the kids who are heading for Spanish 5 this year, next year, and the year before, uh, or uh, yeah, next year and, and the year thereafter are the kids in eighth grade who took it as an elective. So if you offer a course to a few kids, and I checked into it when Dr. Efron was principal, I said, is, can they go through? Is this going to be available in, as, as Spanish 5 in high school as a senior? Yes, it is. It is being. He, well, he just you said know, it's a combined well, class. Well, what it is, it's a combined fourth. And, well, when I came, you know, it was just here. But if you have a combined fourth and fifth level course, I, I don't know if that's a shortcut. 
you know, again, I, I go back. It's an elementary. Why couldn't the elementary teacher take Spanish 5? I don't think that that elementary is a priority when there is a Spanish 5 class that's heading for college. I, I think that that's unfair. Ms. Canal. Okay, please. It'll so be there for you. Back here next year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is a group in the following year that is headed yes. for Spanish five. Yes, I, I think that is a commitment. Okay, then, then there's just one other thing about this. You know, w with all of these cuts in, in terms of courses, you know, once again, I, I think it's important to focus. Is the high school level harder hit than elementary in terms of? deletions in programs and I, and I think it's important that that's established that it is equitable what is happening on all the levels all right. I think this is hard hit I, I do it, it's been coming Polly for a couple of years and this year the money was not there to maintain these very very small classes and very uh, but, you know, it, 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 this was a correction year it, it, it you're right it didn't all happen in one year unfortunately much of it seem to fall this year because of budget constraints. Yeah, I, I, I think my colleagues um, who have been in many budget meetings will tell you, Mrs. Morrison, that I have been um, um, voicing my concern and bleeding. Um, uh, I think the high school has suffered um, uh, some severe cutbacks this year, but I'm not sure that, that it, it's easy to say that we have had more or less or, or, uh, than, than our share. Um, again, the high school enrollment has dropped. The grade school enrollment has, has gone up. And I, I think what we are looking at, at least both, in, I'll speak for the administrative council, we've looked at a way to try and, and keep a, a reasonable balance of resources for all the kids in, in the Cape schools. And I, I think the school board has that same concern. And I am not happy not offering courses. We have a very rich course catalog for a small high school. and. Um, it causes us, it is, it is a source of great pride on the one hand, it's also a source of great difficulty in terms of scheduling it because almost every course is a singleton. Um, and, and it makes it very difficult to put it together. But it's a, it's a course of study which we, we value and are very proud of and we want to maintain. And certainly uh, we have every intention in, in introducing language in, in the early grades of developing a language curriculum that it not only has Spanish 4 or 5 or French 4 or 5, but we've talked about AP courses and other, other ideas so that it's, it's very clear to, to the high school faculty and to the, the really the language faculty in grades 4 through 12 because they've worked very closely as a unit this year in planning the curriculum that we want a, a very well-defined curriculum and one that, that challenges students right on through the last year of high school so that they do not interrupt their language training and that they get a suitable challenge all the way through. And my understanding from, from what I've heard from the superintendent and the board is that they want to support that same kind of curriculum. So I'm, I'm very glad for your concern and I will keep you in mind next, next December when we start this process and let you know for sure when the budget hearings are. Thank you. Rachel, if you'd like to read what you have. <coughs> Um, I'm Rachel Walls, a seventh grade student at um, the middle school. And on behalf of um, seventh grade students, we would like our um, voices like <coughs> to be heard by the s wait a minute by the school board and to be recognized about our feelings on having Mr. Jewett as an eighth grade teacher. Um, there were some petitions signed, which I passed out to Chairwoman Pond. 
And um, they were also signed by parents. Um, there were 81 seventh grade students and 66 um, middle school parents who signed. And that's just basically saying who would like Mr. Jewett to remain an eighth grade teacher. And we hope that you would seriously consider um, having him stay an eighth grade teacher. Rachel, the staffing of, of who teaches what subject is the prerogative of the principal of the school in which that person teaches. That is, that is not something within our, our jurisdiction to control. That's, that's a, a, a decision made by the principals. I appreciate this, and I know that Mr. Jewett certainly appreciates the vote of confidence that he has received. And, and I think that uh, if you would present this to Mr. Toy at this time, <laughs> <laughs> and, and perhaps at a later time you might want to talk with him. <laughs> I commend you on your efforts. Yeah. Is it in regard to this? All right, Ms. Mitchell? All right, there are two cars that are blocking the fire station, and they cannot get their cars out. Uh, do, can you tell me what cars they are? Or a blue and a maroon car blocking. Is it across the street or in the back? If people don't come, come in with a license plate number and we'll. The fire escape. She said the fire station. Right there's here. a fire station behind. There, there's a parent who would like to see Yes, Miss Mitchell? Truck. Fire trucks out there, too. Uh, I'm Susan Mitchell. I have a child in fourth grade, seventh, and ninth. And I just want to uh, have the school board aware of some of the uh, feeling of the recommendation, proposed recommendation, to move Phil Jewett down to seventh grade as opposed to keeping him as an eighth grade teacher. I have talked to Chris about this. I've talked to many people about this. And most of the, the, the signatures that you received, you received probably half of what we could have if we could have circulated it. There were many, many more people that wanted to show support for this. Uh, Phil Jewett has a history in this town. He's taught 20 odd years in this town. He's been a school principal. Most of the kids who would have him next year remember him when he was a school principal. It's like a rite of passage in the town of Cape Elizabeth to have Phil Jewett in the eighth grade as a transitional teacher to high school. There are certain attributes about Phil and his curriculum and his style of teaching that make him an excellent eighth grade teacher. There is a very large void when you take a teacher, a level five teacher like Phil, out of the eighth grade program and eliminate one class's chance to have Phil Jewett in their middle school years. He has uh, certain high standards that he sets in eighth grade that prepare them so well for the high school. Phil's known as the big stick teacher in middle school. He walks through the halls for three years, and then when you get into eighth grade, you finally get him. And when you have him in your classroom, in September, the first day you get into that room, it's instant attention. Phil has that kind of rapport with those kids, whether they're in his homeroom, his, his, uh, his social studies class, or his reading class. He sets very high expectations, and he is the perfect person to be in an eighth grade classroom. Now, what I feel most badly, what I feel very badly about is that if, in fact, he is needed in the seventh grade because the seventh grade is weak, then our class just experienced a weak seventh grade. And probably uh, when they move up into the eighth grade, this, this next year's seventh grade class, they may have to take Phil with them to strengthen that program. Phil's a team leader. He leads the faculty. He leads the students. He leads the parents. He is that kind of a teacher. He balances the eighth grade faculty. And we have tried to balance seventh and eighth grade faculty for uh, a long time now. We've got a very strong John Casey, and we had Phil Jewett. And when Rick Madden was in sixth grade, he was an anchor teacher. We, haven't, we don't have a replacement for Phil Jewett in eighth grade. We've replaced someone's time by one-fifth. We're still missing half a body in eighth grade. We have a larger class than the seventh grade next year. The eighth grade will have a larger a class in, in terms of uh, numbers. There may be special needs, but you've got to consider this class, eighth grade next year, has been told to wait for a lot of things. We're going to work the language program from the ground up. 
they miss it. We're going to have different programs, playground things, the ground up. This class has missed it. I would like to see them have a strong finish. I have expressed this to Chris. I think that an anchor teacher like Phil Jewett belongs in the eighth grade as a transitional teacher to the high school. He prepares them well. He leads the faculty, the students, and the parents. Thank you. This is Mr. Toy. <laughs> the bad guy. Um, I guess first of all, um, I'd like to thank the folks that just spoke, and especially to Rachel. I know it's very difficult for a middle school student to get up and speak, and she did, did a very good job. Um, I understand and I do sympathize with the wish of the eighth grade parents and of the students to keep a teacher of Mr. Jewett's caliber uh, at that grade level. Um, I have spoken to a number of parents um, and I'm more than willing to speak to any others that would call me on the phone. Uh, the latest parent I spoke with was yesterday um, about this and I can say I spent about two hours with that parent so if you want to spend the time I will do that with you. Um, basically what I can tell you is that the decision to move any teacher Excuse and this, me. Yes. I, I, is, are the cars still blocking? And, and it's what kind of a vehicle? Barn. <laughs> Barn. <laughs> all right. I think it'll now be right. moved. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Toy. I, That's I think all right. That's no problem. <laughs> Um, I would simply say that, that this kind of a decision is not taken lightly. Um, I thought back on it and it's really been a five month process to make this kind of a decision. It wasn't a decision that stood by itself. Um, very quickly, I'll just run down what we went through, not, not internally, but um, we needed to increase our staffing in the sixth grade uh, because of budget considerations and numbers. Um, we needed to do that from the existing staff so we couldn't hire any new folks. I then needed to look at the technicalities of certification in terms of in the middle school we're unique in that we have teachers that are certified to teach K-8 elementary and 7-12 secondary and there are technicalities of certification of what they can and cannot teach. So that was very complicated and we had to look at that. Um, my next step was to identify through that certification process uh, the possible teachers that could be impacted I, and I identified all of them. I then <coughs> talked with every single one of those teachers that could be impacted. Um, I met with them as a group so they would know that I was looking at everyone equally and then I met with them as individuals so they could tell me what was on their minds about a possible move without having to be concerned about um, what other people might think about what their concerns were. Um, at that time um, I asked each teacher how they felt about moving and how they would feel or how they might deal with the fact that if I made the decision to move them even if they didn't want to how they might deal with that. And every teacher had to deal with that question. I then brought it to my team leaders, the teachers uh, that in fact work with all of my teachers uh, at the grade level and we spent a number of team meetings talking about the various combinations and there were quite a few permutations that we could think of. Um, we eventually came up with some possible recommendations as to what could work, um, what combinations would be most beneficial for the students and for the teams. And then I had to shut the door and I had to make a decision. And I made that decision after five months of processing with my staff, with the people who would be affected. Um, and um, that's the decision that we finally had to come to. And it wasn't made lightly and I fully understand and I did understand even before we made the decision public that it would be controversial.
Thank Madam you. Madam Chairman, yes. may I ask a question? As a seventh and eighth grade parent next year, can you give me a rundown by grade, the teachers and what curriculum they will be teaching? Can you do that? I think there's a lot of misinformation out mm. there exactly what the, shape, the reshaping of the sixth grade, the seventh grade, and the eighth grade, and the curriculum that these teachers are going to be teaching. Okay. In, well, in, a, even to myself. Right. In the sixth grade, as you know, um, they'll still be pretty much self-contained, except that we'll have teams of teachers, two teachers working together to deliver the curriculum to students. So the sixth grade um, really won't look that much different to students. In the seventh grade, uh, what we're doing is we are going to have two teams of teachers within the seventh grade level. Uh, we'll have a team of two teachers um, and a team of three teachers. The team of two teachers uh, will be Phil Jewett and Ken Plummer. And between the two of them, I have asked them at this point to discuss how they will uh, divide the teaching of the curriculum. Um, I believe that Mr. Plummer, because he has taught science, will probably handle the science. Mr. Jewett will handle the social studies. And they will have to discuss between them how they will handle the language arts, which, remember, is reading and English. There are two language arts courses. And the math, um, which they would probably each take a section of. They'll, they'll each teach two sections of each of the content areas. The team of three, which would be Mr. Wilbur, um, <coughs> Mrs. Welsh, and Mr. Casey, would divide up three sections, there's three teachers, so they would each teach three sections. I mean, each, that team would have to teach three sections of each subject. Mrs. Welsh would teach language arts, uh, which would include, I believe, English and reading. Um, see, this is where you run into the technicalities. Mrs. Welsh technically can't teach anything el else except for language arts. That's what she certified 712. That's all she would be able to teach. Both Mr. Casey and Mr. Wilbur are secondar secondarily certified, but they have what we call multiple endorsements. So they could uh, teach, between them, they can teach the science, the math, the social studies, and a reading section. Mr. Wilbur will probably teach the science. Um, he'll have a math section, and he's going to be teaching reading. Um, Mr. Casey, because he has taught social studies, will teach the social studies for that team. He'll teach math for that team. And I believe those are the two subjects he'll be teaching for that team. The eighth grade um, looks more like the high school. It's departmentalized. Um, as it looks now, we'll have, um, let's see, we'll have three people teaching language, at, well, they're here tonight, uh, Hope Brown, Linda Hull, and Mary McGuire. Mary McGuire will also be teaching math. Um, another how math teacher. How many sections of math? Mary's going to be teaching two sections of math, I believe. Three, three sections of math and two sections of language arts. Um, the other math teacher will be Charlotte Hanna, and she's teaching half time. Social studies will be taught by Mr. Moore. Science will be taught by Mr. Madden. Who have I forgotten? For, well, foreign language will be will be picked up by the foreign language teachers. So there will only be three sections of math? Six. Six. So who picks up the other three? Charlie. OK. Yeah. OK. OK, Charlie? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much. All right, which really leads us into our, oh, excuse me. Ms. Reed?
school board members. Uh, Mr. Toy, uh, you just stated that uh, after you looked at certification to identify the possible teachers, you spoke with all the teachers and asked them what they thought. I didn't hear you tell um, the audience what Mr. Jewett thought. Also, you um, stated that this move was evaluated on the benefit to the students, and I would like to know if the seventh grade uh, students with um, 106 students uh, and the eighth grade with 110 students were uh, given the same weight in determining the benefits of which class he would be best with. Thank you. Uh, first of all, in terms of my discussions with my teachers, um, I think those would, should stay between my teachers and myself unless the teachers would like to discuss that. In terms of uh, the relative benefits, yes, that was looked at. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to uh, item five, which is the curriculum proposal which is a proposal and board action on a new eighth grade language arts program. Good. And Mr. Toy is with us with Nancy. Who's going to start? Mr. Toy. <laughs> I'd like to open tonight by just letting the board um, know about some of the, the reasons why I would support the proposed changes in the eighth grade program. There are three, three major reasons. Uh, firstly, um, I'm pleased by the quality of the curriculum I've seen and I, I believe that um, at each of the presentations that the eighth grade teachers have made, uh, this has unanimously been agreed on that the content um, which is very important, um, is a very high quality content and it is something that uh, we would like our students to be exposed to. I've also been impressed by the process that the uh, eighth grade teachers have laid out. Um, Ms. Hutton will talk more about the content and the process uh, when she speaks after me. Um, the activities and the structure of the course are uniquely appropriate to the learning styles of middle level students. Uh, there are various activities. Uh, we'll be breaking up the period of time so that students are not sitting for long periods um, and so that their attention spans as middle level students are attended to. The second piece um, is more of a um, I guess an administrative, maybe a philosophical piece. I'm pleased that this change was generated by the teachers on their own initiative. Interestingly, their proposal has resulted in more work for them, um, which they've taken on. Um, they're also prepared to continue working in order to fully prepare for this coming year. Eighth grade teachers have worked hard preparing information for us. The information we received from them in the last two section, um, last two presentations represents many additional hours of research, of planning, and organizing. They've put uh, this energy in as individuals, as groups of teachers in uh, the classroom, uh, but also um, with their administrators with you folks as board members and with the community. So they've really um, committed themselves in terms of their energy and their time um, into this, this program that they're proposing. Um, a little off the subject in my discussions with fellow administrators from other communities, one of the major headaches that administrators encounter is the reluctance of their teachers <coughs> to even look at the possibility of making some changes. It's one of the most difficult things to get a faculty to do. Um, there's an interesting anecdote um, at the last um, NELMS conference I went to. One of the presenters asked, how many people here 
would like to improve. And of course, all the hands went up. Um, and then he asked, how many of you are willing to change? Not as many hands went up. And basically tells you that everyone would like to improve, but to make a change is an extremely difficult thing to do. And I realize you don't do change for change's sake, but this is a change that I believe that is very well thought out and will help our students. Um, in short, um, I think that having teachers on my staff that would initiate change of this type um, is commendable. And for that, I, I would like to support them, and I hope that, that you can find a way to do that as well. Finally, um, I believe that this proposal will result in a better education for our students. Um, all middle school students will be required to read and discuss good literature. We want that for all our students. We want them all to write well. And as an addition, something we don't do, uh, well, we don't do it, and that is um, we want them to be able to express themselves orally, to get up, as Rachel just did, and be able to speak to a group. Finally, um, there's agreement by everyone that the content of the curriculum is excellent. I'm committed to seeing that this content is delivered to the students. Um, it's been spelled out what that content is. In fact, another way to look at it, and this will probably make my teachers very nervous, they may want to back down when they hear me say this, um, this change is an, is an opportunity for the teachers and the administration to work closely in the classroom on a plan which the teachers have developed. Another way to look at this is the teachers themselves have agreed to be held accountable for the delivery of quality programming. I fully expect that it will be delivered. I see that as my job to do that. And I would ask you to support them in their willingness to extend themselves to our students. Um, I'd like to invite Nancy Hutton to the podium now to present um, our proposal that has resulted as a result of our several meetings together. Before I present the proposal, I would like to just join Chris in complimenting the eighth grade teachers, Hope Brown, Linda Ho, Mary McGuire, for all their hard work. Um, they really have been a curriculum resource person's delight to work with. As we looked at a situation, they really contributed to the solution and are committed to delivering what they feel and what I also feel is an improved program. My comments will be brief, I hope, <laughs> because we have had a couple of public meetings on this, and instead of trying to reiterate all of that content, just to basically go over what the proposal is. And <clears throat> the major proposal is to move from our current elective program, where students choose between reading, English, writing literature, to a required language arts block for all eighth grade students. Part of this arose, I guess the whole situation came up because the eighth grade teachers were concerned that only 43% of our current eighth grade class is currently taking English. And they felt that more students needed to be enrolled in that kind of instruction. In March, um, the teachers and myself and Michael Efren and Chris came before you with an initial proposal. After that initial proposal, you asked us to go back to develop some more content. Specifically, what would this course look like? How would we keep eighth graders engaged for 80 minutes? Would they be sitting in seats for 80 minutes? For any of us who have spent any amount of time with adolescents, we would never propose that we try to have them in a seat for 80 minutes. So we went back and we looked at what would the program be? What kind of um, content would we present? The teachers really looked at this in terms of presenting four major areas in the area of language arts. Usage instruction, which many people would refer to as grammar instruction. <coughs> Instruction in literature, reading high quality literature and discussing it. Writing and, all, and teaching all types of writing, narratives, expository writing, um, persuasive writing, all major types of writing. And also an area that we have always intended to include in our language arts instruction, but we haven't always been able to deliver, and that is increased work in oral expression. 
So the teachers went back and they worked, and what they did was they began to develop a unit on suspense. They chose the unit on suspense to present to the parents and to the school board in a workshop format because it is a theme that is already touched upon in all of our current courses in language arts. And what they tried to do was to draw from the very best of what we currently offer and then add to that all the improvements that we hope to be able to present next year. In doing this, they really looked at a program that would challenge all students, uh, the wide spectrum of capabilities that they would have in a classroom, and also provide opportunities for success for all students. They looked at something that would also be able to use the materials that we currently have so that it wouldn't be an increased budget cost to adopt this proposal. This proposal really, we feel, we can deliver with the things that we had budgeted for and requested in our budget process earlier. So there's no additional cost. We also, the board also asked us to present this to uh, parents and specifically to seventh grade parents. And that was done on April 30th. Uh, we were pleased by the turnout that night. That was a very busy evening for parents and school board members because it was a budget workshop evening. And we had about 40 to 45 parents who were with us and we understood the time constraints in which they were working because they needed to come over here at 7.30. They listened to us very carefully. We explained the content, some of the things in the activity students would be doing in writing. Um, they had questions for us about how will you know where people are, um, what kind of books will they read, what kinds of discussions will you have, tell us what a mini lesson is and what do you mean by a mini lesson, and that was explained to the parents. We felt as a result of that meeting, in talking with parents during the meeting and after the meeting, and a couple of times since then, uh, where I've had the opportunity to talk to parents, that they really felt comfortable with the content change. They felt that we had designed a program that would keep adolescents engaged for 80 minutes, that we were gonna be offering something that was an improvement over what we already have. The major area of concern that they asked us to consider, though, is that in our original proposal, we had proposed team teaching. And that would involve approximately 40 to 44 eighth graders in an enlarged space with two teachers. That evening of April 30th, the teachers took the parents through some activities. And one of the things that showed the teachers is that they began to say, you know, we have some of the same questions the parents have. Would we have a space big enough to allow for things like noise to not interfere? Would we have a space large enough that we could monitor and keep track of the students? Would we be able to tell that parent that we saw on an informal or a formal basis, how is my child doing and where do they need help? So the proposal we bring forth to you tonight does have a change from our March proposal in that we are not proposing the team teaching. There will still be team planning, but we are proposing that we deliver it in self-contained classrooms, which means 20 to 22 students to one language arts teacher. So that is a major change. If you approve the proposal, the teachers are ready to work this summer to develop more content units, um, some building on themes they've worked on before, perhaps some new added themes or extensions of themes that they've been able to try in their classrooms this year, to address areas of management, small group instruction, how would we design more mini lessons, um, how would we work with individual students, how would we be able to get back to students in response to their writing papers? Assessment issues, what kinds of things would we like to put in their portfolio? How many times do we want to do a writing prompt? Once again, what kind of format do we want to respond back to those students with from their writing prompts? Also looking at um, the area of oral expression, and Michael Efron has tentatively arranged for us to work with Dick Mullen from the high school, who we all know has tremendous success in that area with students, and he is very willing and excited to come and work with the eighth grade to help develop that oral expression section of the language arts block. They also are committed to, they know it's a new program, and if you offer your support to them, they are willing to take on the added work, as Chris said, they're really adding work and more work to their <laughs> workload, but to increase communication with parents, and that means parent meetings throughout the year, several of them throughout the year, in addition to parent open house um, to parent conferences. This would be in addition to. They are also willing to present to the school board in a workshop format, a curriculum update, or a more formal proposal to the school, bo school board at a meeting if you would so desire that. So therefore, 
to sum this up, what we are asking is your approval of our proposal for a change in the eighth grade programming. And the change we would like to move from the current elective program to a required language arts block, which would be 80 minute instructional blocks. And this schedule has been worked out with the entire eighth grade team, not just the language arts teachers. Team planning, instruction covering the areas of usage, literature review, writing, and oral expression, and it will be delivered in self-contained classrooms with an approximate ratio of 20 to 22 to 1. And that's the proposal we would like your comments on and hopefully your approval. Thank you. Are we going to hear from any of the I uh, No, tonight we dismissed the yes. teachers from this right. because they had um, presented three times at a public meeting, and Chris and I felt it was our time to show that we really supported their efforts. I'm sure they would be willing to ask, answer a question if you wanted them to, but we also have some information here that we can answer any questions with if you would like. Okay, fine. All right, before the board addresses this, is there any public comment? Yes, ma'am. I know some of you know that I'm a parent of a seventh grader. I was here speaking before. Um, I'm not really against this program, but the thing that I am against, and I guess I'm addressing Mr. Miles for next uh, ninth grade, is my child went to kindergarten in the high school with no say. He was the first child to go into the middle school with no say. Now you are changing, you are taking away the teacher that they all want now you are changing their whole writing process, which I hope does not hurt them when they go into the high school. One question was asked at the meeting I went to was, is this going to be carried through into the high school? And we were told, no, unless I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. But um, I don't see what this one year is going to benefit them. I think it's wonderful if you want to start in the sixth grade, seventh, and eighth. They have enough to get ready for next year to get ready for high school. Uh, their whole lifestyle is changing. Um, the program sounds good to me, but I really think that next year, when they go into the ninth grade, you people should consider these children and not use them as experiments every single year. Yes, sir. My name is Tom Joyce. I have a sixth grader. Um, I wasn't going to speak on this subject. I didn't even know it was on the agenda, but. Um, Obviously, over the last uh, month and a half, there's been a significant uh, problem with the budget. Uh, I believe a lot of it has been caused by poor planning on the part of uh, the school board and the administration over the last uh, couple of years, including the introduction of programs uh, and not evaluating potential costs. Uh, I'd like to ask whether anyone has thought about whether this would increase the cost, uh, and if so, what have you done? And uh, secondly, if it has, uh, why did you make the decision? Okay. I, I think it was addressed that it was not an increase in cost. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm sorry, then I misunderstood. Ms. Kerrigan? My name is Pat Kerrigan. I have three children, one of whom has already gone through the system. I have a seventh grader and a junior in high school. Um, my one question is, in this, these years of coordination, we have several curriculum coordinators in the school, if there was anything done to coordinate this program with the high school English um, curriculum. I have spoken to three English teachers at the high school who really did not know about this. I'd like somebody to address this. Is that, can you address that? I, I know you mentioned Mr. Mullen. 
Linda, did you want to address that particular question? I, she has this look like she'd like to come up to the microphone. So I'll let Linda Hull answer right. this question for us. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the high school because <clears throat> I've had some reservations about this program, but working with the other two teachers and putting our heads together and coming up with such, such an outstanding program, the best from the English, the best from the writing let, um, I've decided we can, we can really deal with the situations that are going to come up, the problems, if some kids all, we're trying to meet all the kids' needs, and if some of the needs aren't met, we'll handle it and we'll make sure that they are. But what really prompted me to really get into this program was talking to one of the high school English teachers. And she said, <clears throat> over the last seven years, I've been really disappointed with the performance of the kids in English, especially in the usage, the grammar area. And somehow, some of the kids are really missing out there. And as an English teacher, I can't accept that because we're here to prepare them for the high school. And this is what prompted me, and I think the rest of us, to say we've got to take hold here and make sure that the kids have all they need before they get to the high school. And I feel in this, in this program that we will target the four areas that really need to be targeted. Yes? Yes, and I, I agree with you. And we are, I think we are seeing that need. Today we met with the seventh grade teachers to share a lot of ideas and, and discussions about kids and program areas that need to be met in the eighth grade. And we're dealing with Mr. Mullen bringing him down and, and that meshing. And I really agree with you. And I think we're on our way to doing that. Well, is there any way that you can do this this summer when you're planning? To meet with the, the ninth grade teachers? I, d I don't know. I think it would be wonderful. Does someone want to address that? Yeah, I, I think that, that the teachers I I at all levels are concerned about the, the, the communication. And th th we have some, some days at the end of the school year to, to, to work on curriculum, and I, I think that the, the high school English department and the teachers teaching ninth grade uh, courses, but, but really the whole English department um, and, and the middle school, uh, the, the seventh grade team and particularly the eighth grade team with this change um, will, will work very closely to make sure that, that there is a transition that works. My understanding from attending the curriculum workshop and my impression of the curriculum from what I'm, I've heard about it there and, and what I heard about it tonight is that this program will, in fact, um, um, fit um, the the English curriculum in the ninth grade probably better than the than the preceding curriculum, and I think integrates the the language arts curriculum in the eighth grade in a way that the 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 high school English courses are really the language arts courses for for high school students. So I think that in many ways that this is is setting up a, a, a program of study that is. Uh, if you will, more in sync than, than the previous one. And I, I think that, that we are very sensitive to the needs. And I think you're, you're right. We, we need to really work at that communication. It is, it is something we've done, I think, quite well in, in many areas um, this year. And, and I think we will, we hear your message and your question, and we will try to assure you or reassure you that we will work very closely to make sure that that is a very um, uh, well uh, thought out and well planned transition from from the eighth grade curriculum to the ninth grade curriculum and that it fits really as a piece from we're trying to get that to be as seamless as we can all the way through but we will work at that okay any other public comment miss morrison <coughs> um one of the uh, thoughts that I have regarding this. When it was initially presented, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, however long ago, it was stated that the program 
the language arts program would take a little bit of time away from the other surrounding courses. My concern is, since math is, is noted as a weakness in the system, my concern is cutting the math period. Now I know it's only a few minutes, but over the week, those two minutes become 10 minutes. Over the month, it's more. So if this program is to be put in place, I would never want math affected by time. I, I, I think the math is critical. So I, I would hope that that could be adjusted and, and reworked. Um, so math is not shortchanged. Is this a de decrease in time in the other classes, Mr. Toy? Just, it, just yes or no? no. Okay. It's, so right now, we, the program next year would have the same number of minutes in each course. You're sure? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Ted Millett. I have two questions. Um, first, did I understand you correctly that this year there are only 43% of the students in the eighth grade that are participating in a course of English? That's right. <clears throat> In Some English, of them are, this. are they? Are they're they all? all they're all taking something in life. Okay, that's number one. <laughs> uh, number two is, I'd like to know a little bit more about how you're going to keep eighth grade students, which are, for all intents and purposes, hormones in a body, still, for 80 minutes, or how are you going to keep them occupied for 80 minutes at one time? That, that's a good question, and um, we don't know how to keep them still for 80 minutes, so we're not going to try to do that. Within an 80-minute time block, without being specific on a content, I believe, and the teachers will jump right up and correct me if I have this wrong, there would be some kind of a group meeting um, and perhaps a mini lesson related to a usage issue, um, something along the grammatical instruction line. Then they might talk about that and practice that somewhat in, in some type of an activity. There would also be a literature discussion that particular day, either on a short story that they've all read for homework or a short story that they read in class or a portion of a novel that they're reading. And there also would be time for working on a writing activity and a writing prompt during that time. And also perhaps some work in an area of the, all the individual projects that they have designed for that so that there would be several different activities within the time period and on one day one might receive more minutes than another. Um, also allowing for the student who really gets involved in what they're writing and just say, oh, if you just leave me alone for 10 more minutes, I know I could give you the best piece of writing I've ever produced in my life, that the schedule will be flexible enough to allow them to have that 10 more minutes. But the teachers will come prepared each day, planned with enough activities to keep the students engaged, to keep them focused, and to keep them true to the purposes and objectives that they've designed for their program. Ms. Mitchell? Uh, I have two questions. One is 80 minutes uh, is a long period of time for, it, it can be broken down to English, writing lit, English, and uh, reading. It's still language arts to a lot of students. That may not be the strong suit. 80 minutes is a long time. It's a long period to sit through for an adult, for an eighth grader, for a high schooler. It's a long time. Uh, I'd like to know what kind of flexibility is being built into this program. Should they find that 80 minutes, breaking it down to small group discussions, independent reading, however they do break it down in the classroom, if this proves to be too long a period of time, they've never had a class anywhere near equal to 80 minutes. I think their periods are 42, 45 minutes long. This is a significant difference for an eighth grader. It's language arts, no matter how you break it down. It's language arts, and, it's, and as I said, it's not everybody's strong suit. Um, it's one classroom. They may get up, they may walk around. They're still in one classroom for 80 minutes. And my second question is, uh, I, I believe that there is a cost to the summer workshop uh, to prepare this, and I'd like to know what that is. In answer to your um, first question, Sue, I think the teachers, that's the part of the joy and the strength of team planning, that they will get together and plan for this and make revisions as needed, um, both as language arts teachers and also as people on the eighth grade team. And I know I was talking to Hope Brown the other day and she said what they've done is tentatively map out 
all the potential interrupters to next year's programming, meaning things like a special theme week, um, special field trips that they may go on, a uh, focused main study that they do as an interdiscipl interdisciplinary unit, so that they could see how many times classes would be interrupted and begin to plan and coordinate that better for all the curriculums, not just for language arts, but for all of the things that eighth graders are involved in. And I certainly have every faith in this team that if they discover this isn't working, if 80 minutes is too long, that they will look as an eighth grade team and change the block scheduling, which is part of the, the strength of a middle school format, that they could make an internal change, a relatively small internal change, to adjust to anything that came up and to still provide a very high quality program in all the subject areas. Is that right, Hope? I see you're nodding. Okay. The cost to the summer programming, I don't have the exact figure, Sue, but we had, this was an, an issue that the eighth grade teachers brought to our attention shortly after the first quarter. So we had already put into our initial proposal for summer workshop money time for the eighth grade team to work to improve programming. We didn't at that time have it designed exactly for this proposal because we hadn't formulated this entire proposal at that time. But there certainly was money, and I think there's money in there for three half days. And I don't have the exact figures, but I know it's part of the um, budget. It would be fused in all summer work for, at the middle school level, but three half days. I could for figure. three okay. half days for three teachers, and then also um, at least one of those half days for Mr. Mullen. And, but that's already in the budget. It's not an added item or something we're going to take for something we had originally Probably intended. Probably around $800. Three half I may be wrong, but just off the top. Mr. Brimmer. I wasn't. Uh, I also wasn't prepared to speak to this. Uh, I too was concerned about the 80-minute class uh, period, and it sounds like efforts are being made to address that. And I commend you for that. I think the comment I really want to make is that I want to commend the teachers who thought this created this, the administration who supported it, and I urge the school board to deliver carefully, contemplate the honest concerns of the citizens, but move forward with this sort of program because I think any time teachers propose something and administration supports it, that's one of the strengths of the school. Uh, I think of, uh, uh, I'm not a reading lit person, I'm more of a mathematics, uh, science kind of person, but one of the classes I remember best, uh, one of the uh, books I remember best was uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and I remember his comment about the teacher, and gladly would she teach and gladly learn. And when we have a situation where teachers wish to learn, to change, I think that's commendable. Any other public comments? All right, then I'd like to open it for discussion. Uh, for the board, let's put this in the form of a motion, and then we'll discuss it. At the, let's, let's move to adopt this, or let's not at all, but if, I think if we're going to discuss it, we should put no, it I in the form of a motion. I move to adopt it. All right, do I hear a second? second? All right, now we'll open this to discussion, the, the, the motion to adopt a new eighth grade language arts program. Any comments by the, the board? Well, I made the motion. I'll make a very brief comment. I think this fits uh, definitely within the middle school concept that we're trying to implement. I think it, uh, it also represents empowerment, which is a, one of the few buzzwords that I like. It means uh, let the teachers look at the needs, let the teachers look at the resources and come up with a plan. And I think they've done that and I commend them for it. And finally, I think it's clearly another step toward developing a sequential curriculum, something that was a big issue when I ran for the school board two years ago. And uh, I think we've made a lot of progress in that area, and I think this is another important step. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, during our workshop on this curriculum presentation, there was a concern about staffing, uh, scheduling, and being able to fit everything in. Has that been worked out yet? We're looking at um, taking uh, one of the elective courses, which is now currently offered in the academic schedule, which is where we're, we're short of time, 
and putting it into the Allied Arts block. Um, it would still meet for the same amount of time. It would just meet during a different block. We're going to make use of, of a block that we hadn't um, used for academics before. And that would create the, uh, the necessary space in the schedule. Was that the, the, was the problem challenge? Correct. And, and what would people be giving up? A, an allied arts opportunity? Yes. To take challenge, does, is uh, a foreign language considered an allied arts opportunity? No, no, that's, so we're, we're contemplating at this point that that would be, that was one of the uh, academic classes that was already in there. And we're looking down the road at, to it being required next year in the eighth grade. I mean the year after. The year after. Yeah. yeah. Having heard this presentation twice, I'm very impressed with the change in the curriculum and I think it's a very positive one but I have many, many reservations. Some of the parents tonight have addressed them, and it concerns this particular seventh grade class that's going into eighth grade that seems to have had problems all along, either missing or, or, or having something canceled all the way along. So that bothers me as a parent. What bothers me a little bit is the major undertaking to get this program in place by September. I believe they said that we, they had to prepare 12 to 15 kind of theme developments, and uh, Nancy alluded to several other things that they needed to address as far as classroom management and that type of thing. So we have three teachers working on doing new preps in just language arts. With the reshuffling of the middle school, um, I counted eight teachers who will be preparing new preps for September out of 13 teachers. We have two teachers in the sixth grade that will be preparing new preps, one coming from the seventh grade going into the sixth grade, one coming from the fifth grade going into the sixth grade. Um, I'm a little concerned about the amount of preparation that has to be done between now and September 1st. That really concerns me. Um, I think we were faced, I think, last year with my first month on the board with another change in curriculum at the last, essentially at the last minute, but in, in, involved a lot of preparation to get ready. And um, at that time, we were told that there was the resources there from administration to put, to make sure that this, this program was in place, and as it turned out, the particular person that was doing the curriculum change, who was part-time, needed, needed to become a full-time person because she didn't have the support there. So I worry about everything being in place by September. I commend the teachers for their presentation. I support the change. I think it's, it's a continuum of, of the, the K through five language arts program, and I think that's a positive step uh, it bothers me that we're kind of jumping sixth, seventh, and going into eighth grade, but I commend the team that's doing it. I have some major reservations about the amount of work that has to be done by September 1st. Are you going to get it done? I mean, the three of you are sitting out there. Are you committed to get it done? Yes. On three half-day work sessions. That's what I thought. So you're saying on your own nickel you're going to sit down and plan these units so they'll be in place? You already have. Let's see. So my concerns are for this program, but my concerns are for the middle school as a whole and what has happened. Oh. My turn. Okay. I just wanted to address the 80-minute time block. I guess one of the things that came to my mind, and uh, you know, there's, there are probably other reasons because it's, it's eighth grade or something. It seems to me like the kids that are in the lower grades, um, you know, from fourth on up in language arts spend 90 minutes a morning in a language arts block in the same room. So I guess I, I get confused about the concern for eighth graders being able to do that. I think it's just this particular class because they have kind of missed things all along. 
you know, it's the language arts program has been in effect for five years. We're looking at seventh graders who were two years into a program that was changed after them. So that's what that's my concern. Yeah, but here the teachers are saying that this is going to be a better program no, for it's those children. Be a program, but I, and they can deliver. That's that, what they're but saying. I have major reservations with uh, the amount of work that needs to be done through the whole middle schools. Well, it is undoubtedly a lot of work, but uh, change is sometimes invigorating, and uh, they're putting their reputations on the line. But I just hope the enthusiasm from the rest of the middle school team in the changes that are being made will have an adverse effect on the positive three people. We're talking three out of eight. So I'm worried about the other five. We may have a strong language arts program, but we may have some fuzzy areas uh, for the rest of the middle school. I think I'm missing that point. Uh, ex explain it a little, a little more why it would adversely affect the other five. I think morale, if, if, if those teachers are not happy doing what they're doing. You mean with the changes? I'm the, talking the total movement, the thinking? movement oh, and the new okay. preps that right. have to be taken in place. Right. That's my concern. Okay. I support the program that they presented, but I'm having major reservations with the amount of work that's going to be done in the middle school per se between now and September 1st. I always, I, I, I've always thought that new preps were an invigorating process for a teacher that was excited about, I mean, I think in a way not having new preps is the, the dull, you know, didn't have to do anything this summer, going to do the same thing next year I did this year. I, in a way, I think that's a positive thing that, that, there, uh, that there will be, uh, you know, new methods, new uh, materials, new approaches to n even new subjects in some cases by the teachers. So I, I would hope that that would be positive and not looked upon as, as a, you know, a drudgery and a uh, an additional burden that is something exciting. No. I, I hope too that, that after next year when this has been done for a year and everybody sees that this is really terrific and, and exciting and the kids are all being challenged that, that that would then carry over to other teachers who might say wow they, they tried something new and it really worked and, and it's helping the kids maybe we ought to be thinking about um, you know, improving or updating or, or whatever word you want to use, and, and it could have a real positive effect that way as well. Can I, maybe this is the time to ask the question I asked at the uh, that workshop, Nancy, and I know you're probably going to hate me when I ask this question, but... Uh, Everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> we spent a lot of time that night talking about why we have to turn a program in the eighth grade completely upside down and why we can't pilot this program, and perhaps you'd like to refresh my memory as to why you feel that the whole program in the eighth grade has to be changed as opposed to just taking our time, uh, looking at the problems that may arise. I realize that this is a very ambitious program and there's a lot of things that need to be done. I'd, I'd just like to announce publicly that I'm the president of the John Holt Fan Club, so if anyone <laughs> wants to send any things to me, please feel free to do so. <laughs> um, yes, when just uh, actually it's a real appropriate time to ask the question, John, because it comes right on the heels of um, Charlie's question about more work. The teachers really feel, and I, I support them in this effort, that to pilot one program and run three other programs that are already there, that's even more work than trying to put a lot of your energy into something that's new, that's invigorating. That is indeed a lot of work, and these people, as I opened my remarks with, have already put in a tremendous amount of time they're going to put in more time. They're going to put in a tremendous amount more time. And I think probably at some moments they're going to say, why are we doing this? But the strength of team planning will be, we're doing this because, and they will um, energize each other once again. I think it's a proposal that either we support and we agree with or we don't. And to ask them to continue to develop something that's new, that's exciting, that's an improvement, that's appropriate for all students, and also, by the way, still keep going with the old things as well, too, um, is an added burden upon them. And I just think we're going to get better outcomes for our students if we support them, if you so choose, in all of their new energy and in designing the new course as well. And I think we'll get um, a better product for our dollar that way. Did 
any of them want to say anything? Other comments? Uh, well, I'd like to say that Charlie was talking about having sat through this three times. I, I have to tell you, I sat through this four times because uh, I, I, I have really been resistant to this change, and, and I think everybody knows that. Uh, and so I requested about a two-and-a-half-hour meeting with one of the, the teachers involved in this program. And, uh, and I am, uh, I'm from Missouri, and you have to show me. And, and it took two and a half hours, but by the time it was over, I, I, I truly left feeling like my eighth grade daughter had missed out and that she was going to the high school, and if she was going to eighth grade next year, she'd had a better shot than, than she's going to have having uh, not participated in an inclusive language arts program. Um, I, I think all children, no matter how bright or no matter how difficult it is for them to learn, do need usage, do need literature, do need to know how to write well, do need to have, know how to get up and express themselves. And there's no course in eighth grade that gives that opportunity. And I, I, I wouldn't have thought that. And my, my own child said to me, well, I can write all right, but you ought to see the grade I get on the, my punctuation and spelling. So I, I think that's right. And um, um, I, I think I'm, I think these three people are very enthusiastic, and, uh, and I think they're on the wire, and I think they're going to be doing this on their own time, and they can't be doing it because it's the easy way out. In fact, one of these people is going to be teaching even more courses next year than she's teaching this year in order to make the plan work, and it's really hard for me not to support something with this kind of enthusiasm and with this kind of an inclusive idea of what literature and all of these things need to come together and be. Um, someone said, well, language arts isn't for all kids, or it's not their thing. I think it's got to be all kids' thing. I'm, I'm, I'm a great proponent of math, and I, I feel like that needs to be stressed too, but I think the real key for your greatest success is being able to, to function uh, adequately in, in the language arts areas. You face it every day, and you don't have a calculator to help you out. You're, you're, you can see me bumbling up here. I needed more oral language when I was in the eighth grade. <laughs> um, and, and, and truly, I was very resistant to this. In fact, I was almost abrasive in some ways because I, I just it takes me a long time to come around. But I truly believe that this is worth implementing next year, and, and they will be under the gun, or not the gun, the magnifying glass, because uh, I think we are all expecting a great deal. We appreciate their enthusiasm from my standpoint, but uh, I also would hate to see it fail and, uh, and won't let it fail. If it's, if it's not successful, then we'll, we'll have to do something about it midstream. But I don't believe that that's going to happen. If I believe that was ha would happen, I, wouldn't, I would not be voting for this tonight. Any other comments? Uh, the only thing I was going to add, and I meant to ask, answer it a minute ago, was that I think it's real important that whatever we do in eighth grade be really shared with the ninth grade teachers. And I think f I believe that strongly. I said that that night at the, the last session that we had together. I think it's, uh, I'm very impressed with the fact that the teachers have spent this much time on their own time to pull this together. And, uh, and so there are going to be 100 uh, families uh, watching every move that you make. I, I, I don't envy that position at all, to be honest with you. So. I think w one of the first things that needs to happen is the goals of that course need to be distributed as soon as possible to all the people. I think you have them. I just think they haven't been distributed. And another, I, and another thing I just urge you is to, to, to watch out for the students who can go further and also watch out for those who are really trying to master those basics. And boy, that's, I don't envy your job, but I appreciate the fact that, that you think you can do it, and I think you can too. And watch out for all those in between too. <laughs> After all those warnings, I wonder if anybody wants me to withdraw the motion. <laughs> you, don't want to, you don't want to change your mind at this point, do you? I'm not going to, incidentally. Any other discussion? All right, we have a, a, a motion in order and a second uh, on implementing an eighth grade change in the language arts program. All in favor? Opposed? All right, motion carries. I vote a four to one.
We'll move on to the next item, which I have. You should let them go home and get some sleep. So they <laughs> yeah. can start. All right, the next item on the agenda, we will move on to the superintendent's report. Madam Chairman, I'd like to uh, present the school calendar for the uh, second time. And I'd like to present it in two parts because uh, it's imperative that we finish parts of this calendar this evening. Uh, first, I'd like the calendar for 9091 to look something like this. The pupil attendance days would be 175, that's by law, six teacher days, and total days for 181. And the storm days, of course, would be five, and those would be added if we need them. The unique feature to the budget, or um, to the calendar, it would start after Labor Day. It has a two-week holiday break for the students, but on the 3rd and 4th of January, the entire staff comes back for curricular work. Uh, that portion of the calendar I'd like to have a motion on, Madam Chairman, and then I'd like to discuss one second portion of it. Excuse me? I would like to have a, a resolution on the portion of the calendar that I just presented. The, the and then January I'd like to present, yes, 175 days, six teacher days, 181 in all, and uh, the two week break for the students. And then I'd like to come back with part two. All right, so you don't want this calendar a uh, approved in total right Not now. Not at this point. All right, then do I hear a motion that we accept the, the uh, attendance days, teacher days, and uh, holidays. holidays? I move to ex accept the calendar for 175 student days, six teacher's days, five storm days, and two end of breaks and vacations. All right, do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I'm a little uh, confused as to why we're... I guess he's going to explain it now. Are you going to explain I'm going to explain part two. So, I mean, but uh, they're it. unrelated so that one doesn't then go back because there's no opportunity to go back to this motion if there's something in the second part that you're going to discuss. Are they totally unrelated? Well, they're, they're unrelated, yes, to the degree that we can make adjustments. They're unrelated. Mm. <laughs> Why don't you well, tell us what you want to do? Then why don't I take part two, and then we'll do it that yeah. way. Okay. We, have a point we have a motion order. on the floor that's been moved and seconded. I move we table the motion. All right, the motion is seconded. All right, the motion is now tabled. Table. We'll return to it later. Oh, now for part two. Uh, the uh, Teachers Association conducted a survey, a uh, very large survey. You received a copy of that, I believe, yesterday. Uh, and the survey... Uh, and the reality is that uh, it's difficult to please the parents and the teachers and the administration all at the same time. Uh, we were suggesting that uh, uh, the school day on Monday be cut by one hour for curriculum work or workshop works. And uh, apparently, uh, I think it's the, the majority of the teachers do not field that uh, that would be appropriate or we would get enough done in that period of time. Uh, I think uh, the, the survey indicates that. Uh, after hearing this, it was my suggestion that we try it, or I was going to recommend that we try it for a half year to see if it works. Uh, well, it was brought to my attention, and I think rightfully so, that when we determine these dates, the Hebrew Brew School, the Girl Scouts, the Cub Scouts, and a host of organizations make their year around our calendar. And to go a half year and to change it would be to, you know, disrupt a large number of people and organizations. So uh, I think we have a dilemma. We uh, want to get curriculum work done, and uh, we want a period of time. Last year, we had it on Wednesday afternoons, every second week. It worked for us very well, but it brought a number of uh, disturbances, or uh, at least to the parents or some parent groups. 
So uh, I have, I see a dilemma in finding a solution that's going to uh, satisfy the parents, the teachers, and the administration. So what I'm going to ask is that I'm going to go back to my original uh, and recommend to the board that we do for one year, Mondays, one hour, each day for curriculum work. And uh, if you have any questions about the proposed survey of the teachers, the president, I think I saw the president here, will answer any of your questions. All right, Jan. Um, I've thought about this and looked at the survey and listened to what the teachers were saying. And it, it sounded to me like it, it was um, a time block problem, for one thing. The teachers wanted more hours in one block to be able to work together, um, to be able to meet with other schools and do the kind of important work that we talked about earlier. Um, and that Monday was not the best day because Monday is a real productive day in the classroom. And then I thought about the parents and what I've heard the parents say about every other week and how many times out that is and Wednesday was not a good day. And so something that I thought of that, that I really would like to hear why it is or is not a good idea is what about um, one half day a month? which would be a true half day um, where the kids would come home before lunch. Um, and the reason that I, I thought about this was that I thought once a month might be appropriate or easier for parents to, to plan. Um, it would give the same number of hours to teachers for curriculum work because it would be four hours, which is basically what they would get with one hour each, each Monday, but it would be in one block of time and it would give them enough time in between their workshops to, to go back and do whatever work they had to do to prepare for the next workshop and, and schedule very carefully how they were going to use that time. Um, just a suggestion. If you have a half day, when you have an early dismissal of two hours, don't you get full credit for that day? We need three hours in the day. I think we, if we have if three, you go hours, three hours, we get full credit for teacher work day. And uh, that would be approximately the same amount of time uh, if we had a half day per month. That would be nine half days added to the regular programs and the days that we presently have on the calendar. Uh, I'm looking at the administrators, or some of them. Uh, I think we could buy that. Yes, Bar Barbara. <clears throat> Due to the um, sort of mixed results of the survey, I took this question to the Pond Cove team at least yesterday, and we talked at it, about it in detail. And I said, help, help me understand what the teacher survey is trying to, to tell us here, because my understanding is um, no, no teachers, um, except for grades six, seven, eight, have access to each other in the course of a day. Six, seven, eight have been fortunate to be able to have block planning as part of their lives for quite some time. Four, five is going to lose that uh, access to each other next year because of the numbers of sections, and we're going to be at five, five, and five for lunch and allied arts, et cetera. So um, none of our teachers in Pond Cove will have access to one another. I know part of their concern was cutting back from two hours to one. That's clear. I know part of their concern also was Mondays, at least for the K-3 teachers in particular, because they felt Monday coming back from the weekend and all was a, was a highly productive day. And it was also going to be their only day to have access. And I think there are about five holidays that fall on Mondays. And therefore, there's no access on those particular weeks. I'd really like to take back to them the suggestion, because I know a part of their concern was that by the time the children all leave and we get done with bus and get into a room and get going, um, that hour is going to pass really quickly. So I think the um, suggestion, Jan, is a good one. And what I'd like to hear f directly from the teachers, at least in my building, is would, would three and a half to four hours of solid access to each other once a month be, uh, meet the same needs they felt that weekly access would meet in a shorter amount of time. And I'd really like to be able to get back to you with their reaction. We could also uh, bring the, this back to the middle school and the high school. 
Uh, and that doesn't uh, complicate this, Madam Chairman. If I can change my recommendation, I change it to this effect, that the school board accept the calendar as you see it, with the exception of the one hour uh, on Mondays. Disregard that. We'll go back and work out something equal to one day per month in return. Well, no, wait, half that's half day. One, hour per month. one half day. Half day per half month. One half day per month. And we will return and tell you how that would look and where it would be in the, at the June meeting. And then we would have a calendar that we could publish, please. Then all we'll have to do in September is publish those half days. Ms. Reed? Good evening again. Thank you, Barbara, for explaining that. Um, I have 64 signatures from middle school parents who would like the board to consider two options. One is that 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, as Barbara just mentioned, teachers get to meet uh, every day. Uh, so they may not need early release days. We would like to have the board consider perhaps a separation of the schools and realizing that what is needed in K-5 may not be what is needed in 6 8 uh, also, if the teachers in 6-8 do want and need that time, we would like to uh, request that consideration be given to a Friday, all day, 24 hours of early release on 24 Mondays is equal to four school days for the kids, minus lunch, six hours per day. If they could have one day of no school per quarter on a Friday to extend family time or the day before a vacation when the kids are least productive uh, as two alternatives to uh, both of the proposals that have been heard tonight. I'll just pass this to Connie. Thank you. Thank you. Just a comment about that. One, one of the things that comes to my mind, though, is that I still hope that the schools more and more and more are going to try and plan to get together. And so I wouldn't want to take that away by taking away um, Work, the workshop time from 6th, 7th, and 8th. That, uh, and we did discuss that at our, our meeting, Jan, and that's why we asked for consideration to the full day, because then regardless of where that other school has their time, that they would be available. And perhaps four is not needed, perhaps only two or, or what. But those are just some suggestions we would like uh, consideration given to. Thank the you. Only, the other concern that I have is that if you add a day before a week's vacation on Friday, you're now going to see half the school gone on Thursday and half of that gone on Wednesday because of extending vacations and trying to get book flights and everything else. And I think it's important not to, to, to lose as anyway. few school days as possible. John, I, I will ask you to, to uh, I, thank you, I appreciate that, but if you asked at the middle school how many people go to school the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday when the parents say get on a plane, the answer is there's a lot of absenteeism on those days wow. anyway. So I, I understand that this may increase it, but maybe not. Consider that, too. Yes, and uh, we've considered some of the uh, things you mentioned uh, in the Administrative Council. Uh, one of the difficulties is to identify the needs. And then when you do that, you construct certain kinds of things that really disrupt the families because the high school needs this, the middle school needs that. And then the key, the basic key to release time is to get some of our curriculum K-12 together. And you heard people discussing that tonight. And uh, it's quite, it would be wise if we had certain days where we can put K-12 committees together. But uh, we'll be more than happy to consider Anything that's being presented will come back in June and okay. make a recommendation. Can you think of a reason why we should approve this at all tonight if there's going to be changes within a month and we're trying to save money on paper? The only changes that will be made would be the workshop days we're talking but about. But that would come out in a form like this. It would just be a That would repeat. just come out with a memo to the staff and the teacher and the, and the but, parents. But the, the final copy of this would have all of those on it, right? On the back. Do you, do you see, is it expedient that we adopt this tonight? Yes, it is. It's a, people are calling in every day wanting to know when are the vacations, air flights, and a host of things. And we're a month late at this time. Okay. Now, the days and the holidays and the parent conference days and everything that you see here, with the exception of the workshop days, 
are extremely important that be accepted tonight. Okay. All right, we have a motion on the floor, which I think addresses exactly, I think everything was covered in that motion with the exception of the, the uh, early release days. So I think that the motion on the floor would cover, yes. In that motion, um, there are two scheduled workshop days already in place. January 3rd and 4th. Okay, that, that was, was not included. in the motion. I, I will I think add. It, please. It, it, I will add that to the motion. Okay. Yeah, I think it should have been. When is that? The, January 3rd and 4th are also included. Now scheduled also teacher also workshop for days. Consideration? Are they included? They're included January. in what we're going to vote on. Okay. Yeah. Would you like me to read the motion again? Yes. I approve the school calendar. I make a motion that we approve the school calendar for 1990-1991, which contains 175 pupil attendance days, six teacher days, 181 total days, five storm days, and two teacher workshop days on the 3rd and 4th of January. And holidays. And holidays. All right, and it has been seconded. Any further discussion? Yes. This is Mrs. Stanford. Anine Stanford, representing the Education Association. I'm really delighted on behalf of the teachers that you people have really considered the input that we gathered through the survey that we conducted. I do want you to know that more than 50% of the teachers in the school system responded to this, and I thought it was real important. A lot of the comments under input portion of the survey, um, many of those comments were multiple comments by people, therefore I didn't string out 70 comments under each one. I was really happy also to hear Jan suggest that the teachers plan what they would like to do on many of those workshop days that you're, you're planning uh, are going to be so good to give us longer lengths of time, which is what we really wanted. I realize a lot of curriculum work does need to be done. There's a tremendous amount coming our way, and we need time both during school and at other times to accomplish that. One of the major concerns of teachers is that there are other reasons for having workshop days beyond that, much of that being to have just team meetings within your own building and for lesson planning and even in the elementary school which has very little prep time to use some of those workshops for that. A couple of years ago I think we had a workshop committee form to try to get input from teachers and decide what to do with that and I don't believe that exists anymore. We would like to perhaps see another workshop committee that would work on helping to plan what to do with those workshops that we will um, get for next year. Thank you. Thank you. I, I need to apologize because I, I didn't mean to infer that. Um, I, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess um, I, I, would, I would hope that the, that the workshops would be used um, certainly for team planning and, and um, meeting between schools and, and with teams within schools and grade levels. I guess. I would have a hard time um, looking at it as useful time for kids to be out of school if it were used for lesson plans and, and teacher prep time. And I'm sorry if I led you to believe otherwise. But that's certainly a point for discussion some other time. Absolutely it will be because <clears throat> teachers with the amount of curriculum work we're doing, they find that a lot of the time they'd normally spend on some of their preparation for the classroom is being eroded with that. And I think what we're looking for is a certain balance. If we're asked by administration or curriculum coordinators to devote a certain amount of workshop times to that, we'd like to have an occasional workshop come along when we could tie up an awful lot of loose ends, which quite honestly are left undone at this time. I see. Thank you. All right, we have a motion on the floor. All right, are we ready for the question? All in favor of the school calendar? Opposed? All right. Uh, we'll move on to uh, the school hours for 1990 and for, 1991. For informational purposes only, uh, this has been tossed around. We've reworked this many times. We're suggesting that school start the same way it does this year. The only exception would be that the high school will add five minutes to their lunch period, so they would get out at 2.05, and that'll be the only change. And I, two I'm, I'm sorry, two o'clock. That's five minutes more than this year. Now one fifty-five. And I thought, Madam Chairman, I'd take this opportunity to say that 
so that we get it in the paper so people know uh, when they're going to start school. All right. May I go to the next one? Yes, please. All right. I have a question. Yes, there's a question. Um, I also saw in the survey that, that teachers thought it would be very um, appropriate to have middle school and high school um, hours be together from 8 to 2.30. Is that impossible because of buses? Or? It's not impossible, but we have uh, reorganized the buses so that we're going to have one less bus run next year. And uh, we'd like to try that system, and that will be a savings for us. And then, as we start to exchange teachers, we probably will come back in a year or so and uh, try to see if we have the same hours that the middle school and high school probably should go together. But at this point, we've worked it out so that we don't have to change the uh, period of time, any except for the high school. We'd like to try this system for a year. Okay. The, uh, we have an apple. I'm very excited about the application from the high school for a grant from the Coalition of Essential Schools. You have an excellent write-up, but I'm going to ask uh, the principal, Frank Miles, and he may want to say a few words. But you have a four-page write-up with an awful lot of backlight, backup material. Mr. Yes. Uh, early in the year, I was contacted by somebody from the Coalition of Essential Schools who asked if we would be interested in having our school name attached to a, a possible grant um, that the coalition was seeking from United Parcel Service. They were seeking for some funding. Uh, this was even the attachment of our name did not guarantee that we would receive the grant and that we have no guarantee whatsoever. But they did use our name and one other high school, I think, in Maine. And they did receive the grant um, on its merits. And, and the grant proposal is to um, assist schools in beginning to develop uh, all, um, additional kinds of assessment activities for high school curricula. Um, and the, the, the kinds of assessment that they are most interested in in <coughs> us working on um, are assessments which ask students to demonstrate their command of a particular um, discipline or field of inquiry or, or uh, demonstrate a certain mastery by exhibiting that, that mastery um, in some sort of uh, demonstration before a group or before a uh, whether it's a group of, a, of teachers or parents or peers. And we have many such examples of the, those kinds of exhibitions or demonstrations in athletics, in the fine arts, um, in, in the speech and debate program we have in the high school. And uh, there is immediate, um, I think, uh, feedback to the student. Uh, there's a feeling of pride in accomplishment. Um, and there's a feeling, I think, of confidence that, that the student has in their ability to, to, uh, to do something that they have worked very hard on and they, in a sense, are an expert. And it's the, the coalition's belief and a growing number of educators in the country, uh, not just the Coalition of Essential Schools, they're simply one of many reform movements in, in, in secondary education, that it is precisely this kind of change or addition, if you will, to assessment tools that will enhance high school curriculum. Uh, in February, the high school faculty began a series of small group meetings in which we began to look at our high school program and assess uh, the program from our own point of view and to see what kind of shortcomings, um, what, well, first of all, what kind of strengths it had, um, because we feel it has many strengths, but also what kind of shortcomings we saw and, and some of the concerns we had. And we began to, to discover that many of our concerns um, were similar to some of the concerns um, alluded to by the Coalition of Essential Schools. The Coalition of Essential Schools is an organization um, started by uh, Theodore Sizer, who was a former dean of Harvard Graduate School of Education, former headmaster of Phillips Academy Andover, and is now the director of the education program at Brown University. And he wrote a, he, he did a study of public schooling in the mid-80s um, 
and wrote a book called Horace's Compromise and followed that up with another uh, study done by some of his associates um, and published a book called The Shopping Mall High School. And out of that, um, Sizer has extracted, if you will, um, what he believes are some essential common uh, principles of, of a good high school program. Um, and the coalition grant that we are um, applying, uh, applying for um, would um, encourage us to begin to move um, more closely to a school based on those principles. There is, there is no, um, there's no part of the grant that says we must become a member of the coalition. Um, but uh, I think that the, the intent is very clear on the part of the Coalition of Essential Schools that they would like to see us move in that direction, and we know that. Um, and we also know that the, that the common principles are, in a sense, uh, work together as, as a, a group of nine principles. It's hard to sort of pick them off. Uh, the, the first principle is that students learn to use their minds well, that that is really the point of schooling. Um, that students, the second is that the students master a limited number of essential skills and areas of knowledge, that rather than trying to deal with the information explosion that has occurred in, in the 20th century, that students cannot know everything, but what they can learn how to do is to think well and to use information well, and that they should gain confidence in their abilities and develop those abilities by going into some depth in an area rather than trying to cover everything. The third goal is that schools, sh the, the school's goals, whatever they are, should apply to all students, not just a few students, not just an elite group of students or a special group of students, but to all students. Now, this means that the, the goals will vary as the students vary. But, but in, essentially, we are not going to, in a sense, set up separate goals for different groups of students. We're going to have some common goals. And the third is that, is that teaching should be personalized and that efforts should be made to, to have small enough groups of instruction that you can really know the students and have a, a considerable amount of contact. And, and given the class size, sizes that exist in the school district and in the high school, I think we are very close to that goal compared to many high schools that the coalition deals with where there's, each teacher sees 140 or something students a day. A fifth is that the student should be um, seen as the worker and that the teacher really is a, a coach and that the teacher is not really there to sort of impart knowledge, but to help students learn how to, to, to think about uh, knowledge, organize it, become inquirers, and develop their curiosity, and so on. Um, a sixth principle is that the students should be awarded a diploma based on a successful final demonstration of their mastery of, this, of the curriculum, uh, sort of a, an exhibition for graduation. Now, this is not something that we would see ourselves adopting quickly. I think the school I will get to sort of the, uh, an implementation process in a minute. Um, a second is that the, uh, a seventh principle is that there should be a, a a feeling of humanity in the school, of sort of an unanxious expectation that th the school will not threaten you as a student, but will expect much of you, and that there will be a certain uh, level of trust and decency in the school uh, between both students and teachers, and students and students. I think in our high school we already meet that principle quite nicely. Uh, an eighth principle is that principal and teachers sh should perceive themselves as generalists first, uh, teachers and scholars in general e education, and specialists um, second, as experts in but one discipline. Um, that is a, a different notion, I think, in some high schools uh, because it asks teachers to adopt multiple roles, and in many high schools teachers see themselves as content specialists. I think it's not an unusual uh, a view of, of elementary teachers or middle school teachers. But I think it's, it's a useful uh, question for our faculty to consider, and I think that they find that an interesting question. Um, and, and the final is that, that the ultimate administrative and budget target should include, in addition to um, an, a, a total student load of, on average, um, 80 students or fewer per teacher and substantial time for collective planning by teachers and competitive salaries for staff and an ultimate per pupil cost not to exceed um, uh, that at traditional schools by more than 10 percent. 
and I think what the coalition is saying there, and I don't think they're talking about a 10% budget increase here, I think they're saying on an average expenditure basis, a, a good school should not be more costly. It does not have to be more costly. So I'm not suggesting that this is going to cost more money, um, particularly after what we've been through in the last several months. But I, I think these common principles make sense. They are not principles that the high school staff adopts wholeheartedly all at once right now, nor does the coalition expect us to, but I think they're an interesting set of proposals to, to, for us to think about. Specifically, this grant is, is suggesting to us that we, we first of all define very carefully what the outcomes are for courses and what the outcomes are for units. And by outcomes, we mean what do we want students to be able to do when they're done with a particular unit of study. Um, it, it's quite literal, what can they perform? What can they demonstrate? Um, and, and the high school staff um, has um, this spring decided uh, overwhelmingly that this is a very laudable and important goal for us to work on immediately. We have begun working on that um, and intend to accomplish that in the, in the next few months, not only the end of, between now and the end of school, but early in the fall. We think that will enhance uh, many parts of our instructional program. And then, then the, the coalition wants us, I, I'm not sure that we will, I think we'll make an initial attempt at that uh, very soon. And I think then we will begin to work with that and refine that. And as we do that, what the point of the grant is, and the grant is for $10,000 the first year, should we receive this grant at all, and $15,000 the second year, is for us to begin working on exhibition of, of those outcomes uh, and alternative <coughs> forms or additional forms of assessment. So what really we are, we are asking here is, number one, is this a direction um, that the school board wants us to move in? We sense that it, from our previous conversations, that it is, but we simply need an affirmation of that, and the coalition wants an affirmation of that. And secondly, um, um, are we, if you will, if, should we be fortunate enough to receive this grant, may we receive it? Um, and, and, and the coalition does not expect the, the recipients of this grant to, to have less support from their school board. What they want is a, an indication from the school board that they support not only the grant and the, proce the process of, of change, but that the school board will continue to, con to keep its level of support for educational growth and development um, in place. And indeed, we have allocated in anticipation that we might receive this grant um, some of, of the budget funds which we um, have talked about for these many months and some, some particular funds for both ma materials and, and conference and travel, what little of it is left, so that we can, uh, I, and I, I didn't mean that necessarily humorous, Mr. Leslie. <laughs> we, we all have worked hard at that. But th that we really do allocate some of this so that we can move in this direction. Um, there is some left and uh, there needs to be some, but there's very little left. Um, but we've allocated a section of the budget. Pardon? I'm sorry, you don't have more left. Yeah, well, I know you are, and I, I really do know you, you are. But um, what we have said is we will make a commitment from the funds we do have of some of that um, to, to enhance this too. So I guess the, the question is, and I think I put it to you in this proposal, um, how do you feel about this, and where, where are you on that, and may we proceed with your support? Okay. Uh, Put that in the form of a motion and then discuss it. I move that we support um, the high school proceeding to try and, and attain this grant for um, the coalition um, materials and, and for Sizer's work. Okay. Second. All right. Discussion? How much more work is going to be involved? Are they going, is this going to help us in curriculum, or is this, this, this uh, to make us feel good, or, you know, I really haven't got quite the sense of where, what well, the I, energies are going towards. I, 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 I'm glad you asked the question that way. I think that, yes, it will help and enhance our curriculum very specifically, and, and I hope it does make us feel good. One of the selling points um, in our faculty discussions about this has been the, the example of the foreign language teachers this year who are wrestling with the, um, the whole question of how do we develop a foreign language curriculum from grades 4 through 12 that has students starting and, and moving from course to course at different levels, 
perhaps changing languages, moving from um, uh, moving in and out of language courses really in, in a different way than we have in the past. And one of the things that has become clear to the language teachers is that they need to, to make very sp clear to each other and to their students precisely what kinds of skills and outcomes uh, in terms of student behavior and capabilities are, are needed to move from one course level to another. For example, if a student um, begins Spanish in, in the fourth grade and takes Spanish each year right on through, say, eighth grade and moves into the high school, it, it needs to be clear to high school teachers and, to, and also to the, to the teachers all the way through exactly what kind of skills that student will come to the high school with. And so they have found that by, by developing very clear outcomes, they will then be able to make a good placement of that student in one of several high school courses. Um, likewise, a student may take Spanish for three years, grades four, five, and six, and then decide they would like to take French instead or uh, or perhaps they'll, they'll come from out of state and start in the middle school. Again, th those outcomes have to be very specific. And, and that, uh, that kind of argument and its translation or extrapolation into other, other subjects is, is very clear. I think it will help, for example, in the discussion we had earlier about the English curriculums. I think the English courses need to have their outcomes very clear so that we know what to expect of eighth graders and they know what we do expect by having discussions about what clear goals and outcomes are. And I think that the teachers have these goals and outcomes. I'm not sure we always have them in, in explicit enough terms to be able to easily share with each other and, and have discussions. So I think that the kind of, of activity that the, that the grant wants to support, the kind of training it wants to support, the kind of um, opportunities for our staff will greatly enhance curriculum planning. And I, I think that it should make the instructional process clear. And, and I, 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 I see it as both making us um, much, much more capable as teachers. And uh, it's really, I think, part of the reason why the staff is so enthusiastic about the outcomes. Um, I don't want to underestimate the difficulty of doing that and of refining them. It's one thing to get sort of a target list up there and then try them out, and then we will have to shape them. So I think it'll be more by the spring of next year when we'll have a much a really a refined set of these outcomes and in fact that's what the grants timetable indicates that that by the end of the first year you, you really ought to have a set of, of, of target outcomes that are, are pretty clear um, so that by June 1991 each school has determined what the essential skills are and the knowledge that their students are expected to demonstrate mastery of in order to graduate and that in the following year we would really target those exhibition uh, demonstrations does that make clear? So this would, this would enhance what curriculum development that will oh, be? Oh, I think very out. definitely. Okay. And I, I think that it's... It won't be duplication, it'll be enhancement. No, I, well, I don't, I don't think it'll be duplication at all. No, I think it'll be some real solid groundwork for what's going on. Um. Thank you. you. You mentioned that your teachers are excited about this, the target outcomes of the working on the... What do they think specifically of this program? Have, have they been introduced to yeah, this? Well, yeah, we've, we've talked about it, and I, I think that um, what the, the, the coalition um, really is, is interested that there are, in, in a sense, a committed group of teachers, and I think that there is a substantial group in, in the high school. I, um, and I, I think it... Um, I think there's a, a, a large group that want to work on the outcomes, and I think that there's a substantial group that want to work on the exhibitions. I think in any kind of process of change and what the coalition has found is that um, they, do not, uh, they do not get um, uh, overwhelming majorities who want to change. I think we, we talked earlier about the difficulty of change and, and that everybody wants th their curriculum to get to get better, but then when you ask about, well, are you willing to change, um, that takes a, a, an added commitment. I think what the coalition has found is that if there are a committed group of people and a, and a significant minority or even bare majority, and I think we have a, a majority, but not much more than a bare majority who are really committed to the, the longer range, um, the, the people who are 
our skeptics, the coalition is now finding, are very useful. They, they ask very appropriate questions, and they do not uh, permit, if you will, rapid, too rapid a change process. And I think the coalition simply wants an indication that, that we are working, we have an, enough of a group to make a very good, successful, um, if you will, effort to, to implement this change. And what they're finding, and, and one of the reasons I gave you the, the U.S. News and World Report article was to, to indicate to you that it is not a bed of roses. There is significant discussion in all the coalition schools, and the coalition is finding that this, in, in fact, is healthy. And I, I think that there is a group of teachers in the school that wants to do it. Are we unanimous on every one of those nine principles? No, we are not. And, and I do not anticipate knowing the, um, the individualism of the group that we will be uh, next year either. I think it will take a number of years and some significant discussions. Is there flexibility in the school amongst the, the teachers so that if you get this program and you work towards developing the program, your curriculum with this program, that everybody uh, you don't have people that feel on the outside of it or, or people that are like it and some that don't like it and you cause more friction? Yeah, I, I, th I think we're very sensitive to that, John. I think that we uh, understand our diversity and I think that, that what we will see in terms of s some changes, and particularly when we get to the, to the whole notion of demonstrations of mastery and exhibitions, is that this is going to um, be um, an, an incremental change that in some, some teachers and in some courses it will be easier to implement than others. But that the notion that these kinds of exhibitions um, are important and good, I think, is, is seen as valid by, by many, many faculty, even though they, they would not necessarily go whole hog for it. I think they see ways that it would be a very useful adjunct to their courses, um, r regardless of, of what the subject matter is. Indeed, one of the interesting things is that a number of teachers already do some of these things, that, that in fact, m in many science courses, uh, a really well done laboratory is a demonstration and is a learning exhibition that, that students can teach each other and learn from. Um, I think that, that there are, are, are demonstrations in foreign languages of uh, presentations where students get up and speak at, for extended periods of time and demonstrate their proficiency and I think the students feel good about that. So I, even though I think in foreign language in some cases it may be seen by some teachers as more difficult to implement. I'm not, I think there are foreign language teachers who support this, but I'm just using it as an example. Just, just one more comment. You're saying you're working on these goals anyway. That's correct. So this is an opportunity for a grant to pay for that work. That's right. We are going with to no do this whether we get the grant or not. All right. With no commitment on our part for carrying on with this, should we feel either we don't agree with the philosophy or I mean, we, we are not bound by this if we agree to the grant. That's correct. So it, when you say when, when you say bound, uh, I, I think we're bound to a two-year effort for the duration of the grant, but the board is not expected to pick up a like amount of money in the future, and, and uh, there's no guarantee that this is going to last forever. Yes, I would agree with that. that that's my understanding, and that would be my conveyance to them. I have two questions. The number of schools in the coalition um, I do not know the number exactly now. I've heard the number 50, but it, it, it changes, and, and they have changed the way they um, encourage schools to affiliate with the, with the coalition. They no longer, um, they have not found it useful, shall we say, to go in and ask for a majority vote of all of the staff and look for a 60% majority or something like that. I think that they have found that the changes in education um, are incremental, and if you get a, a group who are enthusiastic and you resource them, and it's a good change that the change will, in a sense, sell itself. And I think that, that the best changes in our school district have occurred in precisely that way. And the other thing, I'm addressing the, the $1,500 commitment. There is no matching requirement. No, we, that's our match. I mean, we, we're doing that. That's but our, but that's our money, not their money. The no. Okay. Uh, uh, well, when I say no, I have heard no dollar figure. They want a commitment. Of, of funds on our part, and, and I've simply looked at our budget and said what I think in this year of austerity, relatively speaking, can be our commitment. Um, and, and that was my illusion. Mr. Leslie found Riley humorous, and I understand that wry humor. I just don't want to get into something and find, we get into the program that we're expected to right, I match. Nor do I.
questions? Any other discussion? Are you ready for the question? Would you read it, please? Uh, Ms. Brown? Jan, 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 Jan moved to support the high school proceeding to try to obtain the grant from the Coalition of Essential Schools. All right. Period. Second. All right. All in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much. We're excited. The last day of school. Very quickly, the last day of school, we want to publicize that, is going to be June 15th, barring no inclement, inclement weather. <laughs> this will be a half day in the middle school and high school being dismissed at 11 a.m. and elementary school at 11.45. No lunch will be served that day, and the teachers will return on Monday and Tuesday for curriculum work, June 18 and 19. All right, and then we have moved a new business item up to the superintendent's report. Uh, and we have with us Lyle and James to present our quick response team program. Uh, before I make the report, I'd like to explain that uh, I'm here representing the committee that has been chaired by James Freinlich. A few of us have helped him out some, and uh, this is part of my helping him out. He's actually the one who's responsible for initiating a lot of this committee work, and uh, which has resulted in the report that you see before you tonight. Um, just a little bit of history. Over the past few years, we've had a number of tragic accidents that have resulted in deaths and injury to uh, a number of students. And to some of those, the school, I think, has responded very well. And to some of those, we could have responded in a much more appropriate way, especially those that happened three, four years and five years ago. I think the most successful response that we have made, the most appropriate response, was the school's response to the tragedy that happened at the very beginning of this calendar, this calendar year. Um, a number of us came in early in January to, to uh, respond to uh, a tragedy and uh, that the response of the school I think worked very well and part of the reason for that is that uh, Chris Toy and and Barbara Powers involved a lot of people and one of the people who one of the persons who came in was uh, a person uh, Pam Vos who had attended a workshop where another school had gone through a similar kind of situation and has adopted a policy similar to what you see before you tonight. Um, after we went through the process of uh, responding to that situation, um, we had a debriefing kind of meeting. And just following that, James said, you know, we should set up some kind of formal procedure so that when something like this happens again, we don't have to start from scratch like we often do. Um, and the result of that was the formation of a committee that, that produced this document. In the meantime, some of our staff have gone to different workshops, and it's, amazingly, it's amazing how consistent many schools across the Northeast have similar policies to this. Um, if you would bear with me, I'll just quickly review this. I'm not going to read it for you, but uh, in Roman number one, it basically talks about a core of school staff who will be responsible for making sure that the school is ready, the school and community is ready to respond to some kind of, of tragic <coughs> event. Um, when that event does take place, our Roman numeral two basically talks about how people are pulled together, who should be contacted, and then Roman numeral three talks about developing an action plan to respond to whatever may have happened. And then the last section, Roman numeral four, talks about annual and ongoing activities that will enhance our ability to respond more appropriately as each one of these uh, instances occur. We're talking about uh, training for the team. We are talking about some in-service um, we will be talking about having regular staff meetings so that um, we can do some, some in-service so that teachers will be, more, will be able to be more sensitive to the way that 
professionals respond to students and peers and family members when tragedies happen. And that isn't something you just learn. You have to kind of experience it, process it, go through another experience and process that. And, and we see this as an ongoing process. And in the meantime, building up uh, a resource of materials such as well, perhaps a library of uh, books on things like death and dying. How do you uh, respond to a person who has just experienced a tragedy and those kinds of things? Some of the things that we had to deal with kind of on the spur of the moment when this last situation happened. Um, so with that, uh, if any of you have any questions, either James or I, or I will be happy to respond or any of the administrators who are here tonight. Mr. Greer? In your, I'm just gonna read your statement of purpose. The quick response team is a group of school faculty and community members who will quickly respond to crises affecting the capabilities of schools and community. Confidentiality will be a primary concern throughout the supporting process. I, and then in your core team, I really don't see a community member. Um, yeah, in your, in your <coughs> statement of purpose, that team is school faculty and community, community members. So can you show me how the community members fit into this? In, in section four, we've suggested a school board member be part of that. And we see the school board representing the community. Um, we have not included one of those community members on the core team. Uh, probably, perhaps we should. And I just have a problem with the, with the purpose of state, the statement of purpose, and yet you don't list. If you're not going to have a community member, then don't list it in your in your purpose. Um, we do address that in the team that is pulled together by the school, but we certainly don't. Uh, you're right. We don't do that in the ongoing uh, in-house. Core team. I, yeah, the statement of purpose doesn't say they're part of the core. There, there's a core, and then there's a, another group. And there's the action team that's, the action. that that's includes a core C. team plus members as okay. needed. Two C has a community. Well, we we have the ter term core team, full team, and planning team. And I think Charlie, you're right to, because I'm rereading this. I uh, can see I that just, I'm I not quite sure what all the differences are. Here. I don't see a coordinated. I think the core team is those first five, and then in part 2C, any or all of those could be part of the full team. Is that That's correct. the way I see it? Sure. We felt that if we had too many people initially, it would really complicate the process. The, the purpose of the core team is really to make some quick decisions and quickly involve um, other members of the faculty and community. So I don't know if that answers your question. When you, when you speak of ongoing training, well, what is the source you'd be using for training? We haven't explored all the sources. There seem to be uh, folks up and down the East Coast that, uh, and their training uh, is quite mixed. Uh, Rick Madden did some research on that and found that uh, some of the training is exorbitant and others uh, would fit within a reasonable amount of, of money. And really, uh, Rick has come back to us and said uh, the people who are local would better, he felt, meet our purposes, our individual purposes, our, the community purposes, than some of the folks that are doing this training nationally. We're not asking for any financial assistance at this point. We're just asking for your support, and uh, along with your support, um, a member to uh, work with the ongoing planning. Yes. Any other questions? No, I strongly support the, the, the concept. I think that uh, you were able to pull together a group in January with the situation that we had, and I think handled it very well. And, it shows that uh, when you, you know, mother is the necessity of invention and you had to come together and do it at that time. And I think it's shown that uh, there's a need and I think you've uh, taken some positive steps towards that need and I support the, the creation of the, 
of the quick response team. I have a comment that's somewhat related to this. I'd like to see um, this kind of process developed. Certainly not, it doesn't have to be this complicated, but um, for emergencies that arise here at school, um, if a child has an allergic reaction to a bee sting or um, I know, you know, or insulin reactions or, or whatever, I, I have never seen a written process that's in place to, to take care of those kinds of emergencies as well. There, there is such a, a process, and, and I th there is a, an emergency health procedures um, uh, set up in each school that, that, in fact, gets key people together to deal just with that. So that includes the nurse, the guidance counselors, the administration, um, and, and appropriate people to handle such emergencies. So that's an excellent point, and we will um, work to try to integrate these two, but, but I think that's a good point. There is, there is such a thing. Okay. Any further comments? All right, thank you for the report. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. I'd also like to um, mention Nancy Hutton as part of uh, uh, the, pro the process or the tragedy that happened initially. She was a major part, along with Chris Toy and Barbara Powers. In, uh, and a lot of this policy is based on uh, stacks of uh, policies from other schools, from the state uh, uh, and nationally, but it is also based on the fine work that the administrators did in uh, uh, pulling together a team uh, to address to address the need that emerged. Uh, a lot of this information was as a result of such a, a fine process of doing it by the seat of their pants. So I want to commend them, too, in this process. Thank you. We do also. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to uh, the board chairman's report. I'd like to announce that there will be a school board workshop in regard to the career ladder, which will be held on May 22nd at 7.30 in the high school library. Um, anyone interested should plan to attend. I think it will be very, very informative and uh, certainly uh, has a lot of attention at, at this point in time. 7.30. 7.30. I had 7 written down. Seven. Well, my dates to, is it 7? I have 7.30 in my information. Uh, let's, 7 o'clock. It's 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock on May 22nd. The high school library, 7 o'clock. Right, the next item of business is a, a short report I'd like to, to give on the Main Street 90 committee, uh, which has uh, been composed of school board members and community members who uh, have been involved in a state program which is designed to bring uh, the community closer together, uh, stressing oneness in the community and uh, cooperation. And the school wanted to be a part of this year-long program. And uh, some of the activities that are in the planning stages or already have been implemented are uh, hopefully a, a display of art. Uh, of Cape Elizabeth pictures and, and designs that, that show our town, which will be on display in, uh, around the town, done by art students in the school system. Uh, the, after, the community service after school daycare children have planted seeds in the town center. Uh, they have visited the Viking nursing home and carrying their treasured art projects that they've made to give to the residents there. Uh, if you've been in the town hall upstairs, you may see there's a new school in town uh, bulletin board that has recently been uh, placed there at the request of this committee. Uh, the elementary calendar for next year will feature pictures which are drawn by the elementary students and the theme will be my hometown so the children will be brought, drawing pictures of Cape Elizabeth uh, to be on display in their, their calendar that the parents group puts out each year. Uh, the middle school has been working or will be working in a cleanup program. Uh, the elementary reading program, although really not totally affiliated with Main Street 90, will, I believe, re receive recognition from Main Street 90 in their uh, library program that they've done. 
and their reading program. Uh, they've been planting or will be planting, will be planting flowering shrubs on the school grounds, taking home seedlings, and these are some of the activities that are going on in cooperation between uh, town interested townspeople and the schools in a common theme of Cape Elizabeth being a, a, a one concept community. Uh, I'll move on to a budget update. Uh, let me bring you up to date to where what has happened since our last school board meeting and a lot has happened. It's been a month long process. Um, since our last meeting, we, the first thing that happened was on April 12th, we had a budget workshop with the town. At that time, um, when our budget was presented, the town and school combined increase for next year was a 12.1% increase to the, uh, the present budget. Uh, the town council asked that the school board go back and tr attempt to help them reduce that budget to a 9% increase, which would have necessitated a $263,000 further cuts on the town and school side. The town made some cuts. Uh, the school felt a responsibility to attempt to cut another $233,000 from our budget. April 30th, we had a workshop in this room. Many of you were there. Several hundred of you were there. Uh, the board had asked for the superintendent's recommendations to make these further cuts in a, a goal of reaching 9%. He brought us a list of possibilities. The school board also uh, additionally added possibilities for, for further cuts. And um, after lengthy discussion, public discussion and school board discussion, uh, they, the school board agreed on $89,157 in cuts, which was far from the goal, but which was, to the best of our ability, um, what we felt was a responsible budget to take back based on what we considered further cuts being uh, uh, too detrimental to the school system. These, buts, these um, cuts included special education, travel, equipment, field trips, conferences, fringe benefits, math curriculum work in the summer, a half a position of a career ladder director, uh, and a part of a gifted and talented teacher at the middle school level. We met with the town council again on May 2nd uh, in the high school cafeteria. Uh, after again much lengthy discussion, our, uh, this was with the finance committee, uh, our budget was accepted tentatively by that finance committee. That increase was at 10.8 percent. Uh, they did not we were not required to make further cuts at that time. We also had asked for funding for a portable. That was tentatively uh, passed. This is not the final vote, but this was at that point in time uh, accepted. And also our uh, request for a bond to further our roof repairs was also accepted. Then two days ago on May 14th at the final hearing, a public hearing, um, of which we, we were not an active part. This was truly a town council final public meeting. Um, again, there was much public input and much discussion by the town council. And at that time, it, it, they felt that a single digit increase next year was a necessity. And that uh, necessitated, uh, well, getting the budget to 9.9%, .9%, which was an additional $73,000 in cuts. Uh, of that, they decided that they would make 30 percent of those cuts and that we should make 70 percent of those cuts. Uh, those figures are based on the fact that 30 percent of the budget is on the town side and 70 percent of the budget is on the school side. So that meant that our share of this final cut would be approximately $52,000. And so we come tonight with uh, our superintendent prepared, I believe, to tell us uh, what he feels that these final cuts should be, and then the board will react to this. I, I do not invite public um, comment tonight because all of the cuts that you will be uh, talked about or exposed to tonight have already been on the table before, and everyone has had an opportunity to comment on these, and we feel that we have had a very good um, input and certainly understand 
uh, that all, all or many of these, in fact, all of these uh, possibilities for future cuts are unpleasant. And so we have gotten that input very strongly from the public. And so anything you say further tonight could only increase that um, feeling that we already have, and we, we don't feel like it's necessary. We feel like the time has come that we have to act. Uh, and we have appreciated your input up to this point, and now uh, the buck is going to stop right here. And um, Dr. Pelletier? Yes, Madam Chairman. Again, uh, these are distasteful, uh, but in the best interest of the school system, uh, these would be my recommended cuts for $51,455. The first cut would be home economics in the middle school with its supplies and its teachers, athletics K-12, co-curricular, and that is all over the place, it's, uh, and integrated arts on the K-2 level. And uh, the amounts are, I'm going to pass the amounts out to you, Madam Chairman, and those uh, come to $51,455. The specific athletic cuts are there. The co-curricular are not. They're all over the board. We're working on that presently. And the integrated arts are K2 visual arts. So let's, let's go over these figures. The home economics teacher and supplies would be $37,375. Is that correct? 37 plus 4080. All right, I see the supplies. All right. Athletics would be 5,000, K-12. Co-curricular, 1,000. Integrated arts, K-2, 4,000. All right. I have a question. Mr. Leslie? Why, uh, if in your original proposal, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't a proposal, it was a potential list of cuts, some of which we made. You had a $10,000 plus item that we would have to add if we were to eliminate industrial arts and home economics in order to use their space and make those savings. Why isn't there at least a $5,000 plus number to uh, uh, change the home economic space, which obviously would be required if you're going to use it for something else. No, it wouldn't necess would it necessarily. Be Nothing is necessary. No. Not for the first year. You're not, not, not going to dismantle the, the the room. Your plan is not to dismantle the room. The plan well, is to use the space, but not to necessarily dismantle everything that's in that room. Absolutely nothing. Well, uh, it depends. Uh, we put, we may put uh, French classes in there. We wouldn't have to touch anything. We put the French classes in there. Uh, if uh, if we made it an art room, uh, we want to leave all of the equipment there because it's a sink. That would be minimal. The tables are there. Those are the two options we have at the present time. Madam it distressed me when I had when we had to go back and make further cuts, but I know the die was the die was cast. I spent essentially the last few days, a good many hours. I spent probably about three hours yesterday just going over the the expenses and proposed, and I spent about three hours today with the business manager, just where I felt I had found some possible some possible cuts and and as I went over them item by item I just you know they were eliminated from my budget I had some concerns and I I voiced those to the board and I voiced them to the to the business manager about some what I feel are some overruns that we've had this year that I hope that they're going to watch very very closely next year um, Looking for cuts myself, I just could not come up with 51455 I mean, the closest I could come was essentially about 30000 And it, it distresses me, and I just, 
I just hate to see a, what I feel, an essential program to the middle school cut. And I, I see it the, the complete elimination of home economics from our school system. Charlie, I uh, heard of your, your efforts, but I haven't had a chance to uh, you know, speak uh, to you about them. But uh, one of the things that I've heard in the last couple of days uh, in the corridors, on the playing fields, and over the telephone uh, is the repeated uh, assertion that we do have such areas, such as the ones that you were looking for. And I assume you were responding to the same, same types of comments. Uh, and, and you put in how many hours, would you say? Probably about six. Yeah. And that would be going over materials that we'd already gone over earlier. Right. Uh, so I think it is, although I'm very distressed by this whole situation, I think it is of some comfort to know that you, you did that. And I uh, commend you for it. Well, it's, this process really began, I guess, sitting here, I was sitting home last night thinking about this, March 8th, which is 66 days ago. Uh, since that time, uh, and I think at our first meeting, which I, I think was the middle school budget workshop, if I'm not mistaken, my, cal my calendar is right, uh, we have spent together, the five of us, probably more time than I spent home, um, going over this budget at least three times. We spent numerable hours ourselves going over this budget at home, trying to find ways to, to not go through the process that we're going through tonight. Because I can guarantee you that uh, when we all decided to run for this office, and of course nobody twisted our arm, these are the kind of things you don't like to have to do. I've learned a lot. Well, actually, this, this kind of, I thought I got away a week ago Saturday. I was on my way to Chicago for a week-long uh, meeting. And I put, uh, took my Walkman with me, and I was all alone. I had nobody next to me on the seat, and I put the headset on and put a tape in, and all of a sudden I had a tap on my shoulder, and it was a Cape Elizabeth resident who wanted to talk about the, the things that were going on. So I took the headset off. We sat there for the ride to Chicago for a while, and we talked about it. So no matter where you go uh, this past year, you haven't been able to get away from this. Um, I've worked on a lot of committees, and I want to say publicly that the people that are on this dais uh, or this platform have put in a lot, a lot of time this year. And I'm very proud to be a part of this group. Uh, this, nobody came with any preconceived ideas. Nobody came with any axes to grind. Uh, nobody came with any uh, areas that they felt could be untouched um, and they were sacrosanct. I think everybody came with an open mind and uh, knew that this was going to be a very difficult budget year. The other thing I found very interesting is that, uh, and Loretta pointed this out to me because I was a little disappointed when we chatted about this the other day, that all the effort that the community had put out, you know, fell on deaf ears with the town council. And I think Loretta pointed out very accurately that it didn't. The first meeting that we had, which was a very relatively sparsely attended meeting when we first got together to discuss the budget, the first number that came up was 6% increase. Now when you look at a 6% increase versus the 12 point two, one that we went to originally, we had a big gap. The next number we heard thrown out was 9%. Uh, we wound up at 9.9, .9, which I feel is a, probably a relatively good compromise, considering where the town council's position was when we started. And I think, as Loretta accurately pointed out, that you people made a big difference. The fact that the fire marshal was here that night and there were 400 people standing here talking about this, made an impact. And I think it may not have been the ultimate impact that we had wanted, but we certainly came a long way from 6%. We came a long way from 9%. And I think at this stage, every dollar this year really counts. I don't support a reduction. I think we worked very hard, very long, and presented the town council with a budget that was very realistic and I think was supported by the vast majority of this town. That's my opinion. I'm not on the town council. They have the power to tax. They have a constituency. We have to work together. We have to compromise. And while I don't think any of us are 
ecstatic about what happened. I think we came a long way from where their intentions were at the first meeting until where we are tonight. The thing that I fear the most is that this is just the start of what's going to be a couple of tough budget years. And the list that we talked about at our first public session of the options that we had to cut is a list that we'll probably be carrying with us for the next year, if not the next two years. One of the things we have discussed with the administration is that uh, as we look at budgeting next year and expending money, we have to watch every dollar possible because as we put together this budget this year, we have $350 that we're carrying over. $350,000 that we're carrying over. Thank you. Um, we have to be very careful about where the dollars get spent. Uh, it's a process that has been difficult, painful at times, and one that uh, hopefully the economic situation will turn around in another year. We don't have to go through that again, but I'm not sure I can be that optimistic. But I think that you folks uh, deserve a lot of support and a lot of credit for the outcome of uh, the budget process this year. John, I want to uh, agree with everything you said and uh, then perhaps add only one thing to it, and that is, you know, while the town council did uh, compromise and, uh, you know, each side came quite a distance, uh, I think there is a bona fide debate uh, in the town. I think it's going to go on. It's going to be <coughs> a debate uh, between reasonable people on issues in which reasonable people can differ. But essentially it's uh, going to be about taxation. It's going to be about Cape Elizabeth's commitment to education. My own personal view is that uh, these events, this cut we're making tonight particularly, on top of all the other cuts that we've made, those in the high school we also discussed tonight, people are upset about them. I think those are, are real issues and they're going to be with us. Uh, my own personal view is that uh, Cape Elizabeth uh, in this process, which was uh, uh, certainly political, uh, but certainly within the mainstream of uh, American politics, we had uh, uh, elected officials uh, being besieged by the electorate, we had demonstrations, we had people in costumes, we had signs. Uh, it certainly wasn't uh, perhaps uh, as important as people demonstrating for civil rights or against the Vietnam War, but uh, it, was a, it was a real political process and one that's going to go on. And I think that's as it should be. And I think that any, uh, uh, any attempt to say that we, the elected officials, and we, the, uh, the residents of this town, should always uh, agree on everything is uh, just not the way it's going to be or the way it should be. Uh, I think everybody uh, conducted themselves, and I mean everybody, uh, with a great deal of uh, uh, decorum, and uh, uh, I, I'm quite sure that it is going to continue, uh, we're going to continue this debate uh, in the town uh, in that atmosphere. On another subject, uh, the subject of this major cut that, uh, is, uh, that we're discussing tonight, uh, home economics, uh, and this is certainly one that uh, I do not want to make a cut, but uh, I do not want to cut. But it is a subject which, to some extent, we, the residents of this town, can teach our children ourselves. We'll have to take up uh, uh, some of that slack. It's also a subject which uh, hopefully community services can uh, uh, get involved in. By the same token, uh, cuts in athletics, and I would not be in favor of any more cuts uh, in the academic program unless there were some corresponding cuts in, in athletics. I'm a great supporter of athletics, but uh, Above all, our business is academics, and it's uh, traditional academics, and that's what Cape Elizabeth School System has <coughs> distinguished itself for for many years. Again, in the cuts in athletics, I think it's going to be up to the residents uh, to organize themselves and uh, provide some extra funds. Uh, the boosters clubs are going to have more work to do. Um, it's not a happy situation. I. Uh, 
don't want to vote for any of this, but uh, I think that's uh, what we're facing at this moment. There's very little to add. It's terribly painful. Um, I, I concur that we have to continue to work together with town council, with parents, with everybody in the community to try and, and help us through the next budget year as well. I guess the only comment that I heard the other night at the public meeting that I, I would like to clarify is that in no way did the school board um, or, or Dr. Pelletier, I believe, list any cuts that were made for, uh, to, to stimulate an emotional response from people. That's just not where we're coming from. And I hope people understand that, that this is very, very painful. I, I still have a pro I don't want to divide the, the board but I, I still have a problem with the equity and where the cuts have come from across the board and I, I will carry that with me um, you know looking to to eliminate this type type of cut you know I've addressed are we at at a curriculum level in K through five that we could start to phase out that curriculum director. Having talked to critical period, we feel that we really need one more year to make sure that certain processes are in. I still have a problem with that. Um, uh, I just, you know, we got, we got a feedback the other night from, from the town council that they felt administrative costs were high. Um, that's a matter of opinion. You know, I'm still very uncomfortable, even after six hours. And if, if I had my way, I would, you know, we've made in an integrated arts a $4,000 cut. Maybe we need to look at that programming and maybe after the number of years it's been in effect, it's time to change and maybe integrate it more into to what programs are in place. Um, that's where I would, those are the two areas where I would look. I would look at three areas, um, administrative cuts, and I think we could come up with those cuts. Can I ask a question? I understand that the town council has told you you have so much money. And that's it by the budget process. Okay. Why, are there, if you have so much money and there's a period of time that you can use to study this, why are cuts being made this particular time, two days after they told you how much money you have? Because we've been studying it for six months. We've been well, studying it actively study. for three months. I, I understand your concern. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, yeah. This is the worst night of my being on school board because I don't want to do this and there's nothing here I want to cut. I don't want to cut athletics because I, you know, we want to keep the kids off the street. We want them to have activities. We want to keep them busy and, and, uh, and yet we have to cut a program that does those things. Uh, I, I think the cuts are workable. Uh, I think it will cost some people money. It will cost the boosters. It will cost uh, the kids themselves. Or it will compromise the program to some degree. I don't want to cut integrated arts. I don't want to cut it one bit. I think that's a program that, uh, that children would never get, uh, most children would never get except in the school system. And it involves 1,100 students having these opportunities to, to be with true artists on a first name basis, making films, making puppets, doing poetry. I, I, I think it's a very exciting program. I hope that $4,000 cut in K through two doesn't mean that they get nothing. I hope it means that somehow that's altered, but not excluded from that program. And I certainly don't want to cut home economics. 
particularly don't want to cut home economics because it's a program that's vital, it's well taught, and it is, um, it's filled. It's not a situation like we have at the high school where there's not an interest or, or the numbers to support it. The numbers are there to support it. And, and I've gone over every other possibility that's not being addressed tonight. And I could, I won't do it, but I could tell you why I don't support any of those either. And so this is a, a no-win time right now, in my estimation. There's, there's nothing that's right to do. And so the way I've justified this, and I had to justify it, and that is that I personally and, and the rest of you out there with kids coming along at all are going to have to, when they say, Mommy, can I stir the, the pot, you better let them because this is going to be your responsibility for a period of time, maybe forever. Um, and I think we're going to have to take that responsibility in our homes uh, because perhaps we can't teach them a foreign language at home and perhaps we can't teach them how to use a computer at home and I certainly can't provide them an opportunities to be with visiting artists in my home but I can help my child learn to sew even though I don't sew at all and I can teach them to cook a little bit and I, when, I, I, when I realized this afternoon what the recommendation was, I, I, I did call Sue Weatherby and I said, can you help us out? What can you do for us if this happens? And, and I think that we can institute some after school programs. The children would pay for them, just like all the other community service programs. But sixth, seventh, and eighth graders could have opportunities to cook after school. If they're in sports programs, perhaps they could uh, have the opportunity in the evenings to, to make meals, eat the meals. It certainly doesn't come close to getting what they're getting right now, but it's a compromise that perhaps won't completely take that program away from all children who are interested. And so I'm going to support these cuts, but not because I want to. Further discussion? All right, I think we should have a motion to, to accept these cuts. I move that we accept the cuts uh, totaling $51,455 as recommended by the superintendent. I hear a second. Second. Is there any further discussion? All right, we'll bring it to a vote. All in favor of the cuts that are recommended on this sheet of paper. Opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, we'll move into new business, a policy, special education tutoring. First reading of the policy. This is a policy regarding exceptional students enrolled in private schools. Dr. Pelletier, would you right. read it, please? Yes. Shall be the policy of Cape Elizabeth School Committee to provide special education and related services to exceptional children who are enrolled in private schools within our local school facility. Service provision will include transportation to and from Cape Elizabeth schools, will be delivered by personnel employed by the school department, and will be compliant with all related state and federal regulations. This is in line with State Department uh, officials. This is the first reading. So this, if this is a state mandate that we have to draw Yes, this. that we have to do it, but uh, we want to do it on our premises and that's their recommendation. And we've had people call and ask to do it other places in private schools, and I'd like to put a stop to that, definitely. We've had two instances in the last five years where uh, young people who qualify have been tutored in private schools. That's a very expensive proposition, and my concern is if that would grow, and you had 100 people and 50 qualified, we would have a bill that would be outrageous. So I'd like a policy uh, so that I could tell parents that this is our policy 
and uh, we will, we're forced to do the work, but it will be done on our premises with our people. When it says within our local school facilities in that third line, who are enrolled in private schools within our local school facilities, it's a I don't get it. It's I don't confusingly get that. worded. I don't, that Darryl. word doesn't Maybe seem. <laughs> yes, please do. Is that a mistake? It's late in the year. Uh, is the best I can do for you. As I read that to that again tonight, um, I prayed that my English teacher, Mrs. Pratt, wouldn't roll over. Uh, that is simply a structural error, and I will revise that with Corny for the second District. reading. It is, um, in fact, I rewrote it. Let me just kidding. If you were to read it, uh, let me read it to you. Um, it shall be the policy of the Cape Elizabeth School Committee to provide within our local school facilities special education and related services to exceptional children who are enrolled in private schools. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Okay. Uh, it clears it up. I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. Will it be in that form at the second reading? Yes, it will, Loretta. I apologize. <laughs> and can it be considered a second reading? With and second uh, reading? I am considering enrolling with Hope and the staff at eighth grade for next year. <laughs> anyway, that's that's how that will, how that will read in the second reading. I'm sorry. So, Child, one other question. question. Sure. So exceptional students means both special ed, needing special needs, and gifted, talented? No, it does not, uh, Charlie. By definition, uh, exceptional children means those defined by Maine and federal law as children requiring special education due to a handicapping condition, of which there are nine defined handicapping conditions. Gifted and talented is not one of those nine. other discussion this is just the first reading so we'll see this again next month second policy on the post-secondary enrollment options this basically says that if a youngster qualifies can go to the University of Maine system or the vocational technical school at our expense if it if he's eligible the criteria is well spelled out Graduation credits for courses taken under this option will be determined as follows. Attendance policy and the financial assistance. This comes right straight from headquarters. By that I mean Augusta. Yeah, I have one question on 1B and that is, uh, it seems to me that maintaining at least a passing grade in his or her courses overall is not a very high standard for somebody for whom we are incurring extra expense. I agree. Can we elevate that to a B average or? Yes, certainly. You might remember that during the budget process way back in February, we talked briefly about a small allocation of funds in the budget to um, provide for this and for these youngsters. That's what this is, just to refresh your memory on that. This is reimbursed. Now, in that particular issue, Peter, this um, comes to you. I'm, I'm glad it does come to you as a first reading. Um, this came, we used as a model the one that was sent to us by the State Department after the legislature passed the law. And then I sent this on to Frank and Sharon. And he, he might want to address that particular issue, um, but in part, I was looking for feedback from the board to guide us on this also. It sounds well, as though this is one of those places. This is expense. Uh, you, you said it's reimbursed. It's reimbursed. It, it is all reimbursed. It's all reimbursed. And I say that state. knowing that legislature can change its rules, of course, but it is, it, it is currently told to us that it will be completely reimbursed, our expenditures, for the things that we outline in the policy. It won't be reimbursed if, a, if the board or any means school boards do not adopt a policy to put this in place. And we currently have youngsters going to the university, uh, which this would n not necessarily affect, but we wanted to put it in place in order to do that for next year, where we have 
or when we have, I believe, three to five youngsters being con who are considering this? Well, I'm, I'm somewhat more relaxed about it if, uh, if uh, there's no cost to, to us. There's no cost, and that's why it's written However, this way. However, uh, it's just a matter of sort of overall education policy. I can't see the state or the uh, district incurring extra expense for somebody for whom the standard is only maintaining passing grades. Yeah, I'll defer that to my colleague. <laughs> I can understand, perhaps, while he's coming up, that certain students will be at third year university level math and be struggling with English. Uh, I suppose that's possible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah. Or you could be getting a, a C in calculus be going for English. Absolutely. Yeah. You're concerned about the standard of, of grades as, a, as opposed to the principle of sending them to the university when we cannot offer a comparable course, is that? Oh no, I'm delighted to send them to the university that, that's when right. we can't that's offer a comparable that's, course. Uh, it just struck me that we were incurring an expense. Yeah, that's and right. You'd, you'd like to see a higher person. grade. And I'd like to see a higher overall right. average to earn that privilege. Um, I'm, I'm pausing because I'm trying to think of, uh, of why I, we didn't respond to that. I think in the case of the students who are going, their grades are exceptional. Most of them are straight-A students. I mean, we could, we could I don't think we'd want to put that standard, but we could certainly say they, they could be honor roll students without any problem at all. The, the students who are going to be going to university uh, ne next year, or for that matter going this year, are in the top 10, 10 in their class. So we're not talking about uh, academic laggards at all. I withdraw the nitpick in okay. view of the late hour. We, we, we will, uh, we will uh, amend the, the document for the second meeting. All right, we have a cons consideration of a request by the superintendent to enter executive session for the purposes of discussing the evaluation of the superintendent and personnel matters. So moved. Second. All in favor? 